here. But what many of us don't realize is the journey ahead is a long one. Good evening to everyone present here. Today, the topic for our panel discussion is the obstacles faced in the professional career and how you overcame it. Don't let what I said dishearten you because today we have an accomplished set of doctors who have raised the bars in the fields they have chosen. But as they will soon explain, the road has not been easy. You will also soon, along the course of your professional career, face obstacles as well. But rather than taking it as an indication of failure, accept it as an interruption to success. Because the greater the obstacle, the more glory in overcoming it. Today, I am happy to introduce this set of panelists who are the very embodiment of perseverance. Our moderator for today's panel discussion will be Dr. Colonel Vishal Marwaha. He's a graduate of the Armed Forces Medical College and did his MD in general medicine, DNB in internal medicine, did his long-term postdoctoral fellowship in rheumatology from Ames, Delhi, short-term fellowship in City Hospital and Queen's Hospital, Nottingham. He also served in the Indian Army for 28 years as a true patriot. Sir's so father, elder brother, and four of his uncles have served in the Indian Army and the Indian Air Force. He headed the Indo-Bhutan Friendship Hospital in Timpu, Bhutan early on in his career. He also served in four rheumatology centers in the armed forces. Other accolades to his name include the prestigious Chief of Army Staff Commendation Award in 2012, the prestigious Army Commander Commendation Award twice in 2008 and 2010 for meritorious service. He then joined Amrita School of Medicine in 2016 as HOD, Department of Rheumatology. And sir has been serving as our beloved principal here since May 2017. Sir, I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Dear friends, humble pranams at the lotus feet of our dear Amma. I welcome you to this panel discussion today evening, as was introduced a few minutes back. We will be looking at the professional journey of eight distinguished and accomplished professors and heads of the departments of Amrita School of Medicine. They will be sharing their experiences and challenges with all of us. As a medical student and as residents, the professors mean the world to us. Many a times, a particular personality influences us so much that we go, get drawn to that subject. As a principal, I constantly am in touch with the students and I know how much they adore their teachers. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat, Parama Brahma, Dasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. The status of the Guru is so significant that it cannot be overemphasized. With a brief, brief introduction, I will now introduce the panelists for today. We have amongst us Dr. Subramani Ayer, Professor and Chairman, Division of Plastic Reconstructive Surgery, Head and Neck Surgery, Surgical Oncology, CMF Surgery in Amrita School of Medicine, Ames Kochi. Dr. R. Krishna Kumar, Professor and Head of Pediatric Cardiology at our institute. Dr. Radha Mani K., Professor and Head, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in our institute. Professor C. Jayakumar, HOD of Pediatrics at AIMS Kochi. Professor Gopal S. Pillay, HOD of Ophthalmology. Professor M. G. K. Pillay, HOD of General Medicine. Professor Prince Louis Pallati, HOD of Pharmacology, and Professor Pradeep Jacob, Head of Department of General Surgery. Actually, when you realize, it's actually the experience, I think, what we call 
as the one of the major things you know like even when when i was in the armed forces i recollect one very you know i'll share one incident i was in the punjab problem was you know it was actually on the you know it was reducing somewhere around 1991 91 i think the year was i was with the battalion the 6th battalion the rajput regiment and you know we were stationed in punjab and you know once a cordon and search operation had to be done and you know there was of there were less officers that day and my ceo at that time was colonel varinder singh tong who retired as a lieutenant general later on a very fine gentleman he told me barwa today i'll have to give you an additional role i was a young captain that you will have to you know uh, do cordon and search so you know i was basically given a little additional role and uh, jco was there with me i still remember in that operations the subedar sahab taught me so much there was you know in that you know one day the lot of things which you know i would never have learned otherwise i picked up because it was his years of experience which he was sharing with me about a cordon and search operation so i just we we all during our rounds you know you see how often we have so many doubts and our you know teachers they clarify and uh, you know sometimes they share with us their you know challenges also they sometimes would tell us that you know how in a particular case where the diagnosis was not correct and later on how it you know was diagnosed so many uh, things which are shared which are you know from you know which you learn word of mouth i think all that actually is so important in uh, you know then apart from you know the medical there is so much of non medical like you know your uh, i would say work ethics that's very important now so you will learn your work ethics from your teachers they, they are coming on time you know so many things if they say 8 means 8 it's not 8:15 you know you come 10 minutes late i still remember when i you know we went to a basic course and when today the in the inaugural function the rear admiral arthi suri was mentioning about the you know various military courses which you do one was medical of it is called the medical officers basic course so you know when you you know reach late you know i remember the you know our uh, guru you know the the, the ustad he you know havaldar kartar singh and i was there you know, he just show you don't have to tell us anything he just takes he does this means you take four rounds you know so the of the round so next day you will automatically be 10 minutes earlier so i think it's so important that you know you move on and keep learning i remember when i was doing my rheumatology one of my teachers rajiva gupta is heading rheumatology at medanta now he told me one thing which is so beautiful he said marwa there lot of plus and minus you know all of us have you will there will be a lot of plus there will be a lot of minus you are you have to take the plus and move on the minus you can just forget it so i think these are the things we need to uh, look at when we move ahead so to start with i will now introduce dr subramanya ayer who will be the first panelist today dr subramanya ayer he is as i mentioned he is the head of Uh, the head and neck surgery and plastic surgery in our institute he is a graduate from the medical college kottayam he did his further training in head and neck surgery and plastic surgery from aims new delhi medical college calicut and other centers in the united kingdom he did fellowship training in craniofacial surgery in mexico uicc fellowship in laryngeal cancer surgery center oscar lambrecht and tissue engineering in rice university hostel under professor mikos he is professor and chairman division of plastic reconstructive surgery past president indian society of facial plastic surgery fhno indian head and neck society association of plastic surgeons of india past secretary indian society of microsurgery fhno currently president of head and neck cooperative research group of india Eurasian Association of Head and Neck Oncology governing council member of the Asia Pacific Thyroid Society he led the team that was awarded the BMJ best surgical team of southeast asia 2015 for performing the first bilateral hand transplants in the country it is to the credit of the all the amrita institute of medical Science, uh, sciences that we have done eight hands and forearm and midarm transplants till now 
and Professor Subramanian Iyer has led the team. I will request Dr. Subramanian Iyer to please speak to the audience. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, opportunity given to uh, me, and then uh, uh, it was. It is indeed a great pressure always to talk to the uh, to this. Uh, uh, meeting in this meeting uh, can i share my screen can you allow me to share the screen yeah. okay i hope it is visible is it Is it visible? Is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, I'll go ahead. So it is uh, indeed a great uh, privilege to talk to you all because this has been one of the uh, memorable sort of events every year now in our institution. And you see a lot of young uh, budding doctors coming to the institute and then getting exposed to a lot of things, mingling with a lot of people. Unfortunately, we couldn't all meet you personally this time, but this is uh, in a way, very good way of interacting. So uh, the, the topic is challenges. And the question is, you all have to know, is that how do you become a successful professional? You become a successful professional when you are passionate in the things you do. When you, are, when you have uh, become a doctor, we are bound to become doctors, and then you are going to be some specialist, or whatever is that, whenever you are passionate in the things you do, you become successful. And whenever you are passionate, challenges are born. Because when you, when you are passionate about things, it is not easy to realize that passion or get into the, the things which you want to do. And those are the challenges you are going to face in your life. And I just go through few of the things which uh, I thought some significant challenges and significant things which uh, I faced personally in my professional life and then uh, narrate it to you through some pictures and all those things and then situations. Now, I, uh, Marwa sir uh, introduced me that I, I was trained in, uh, you know, I got my hedonic training in AIMS. And in fact, I, I joined for ENT and the passion for the hedonic cancer treatment started there, seeing the patients. And you know, this is, uh, this is something you, uh, you will develop, all of you will develop in, in course of time, some passion for something you see in your professional life, be it be medicine or surgery or anything, forensic medicine or any specialty, you will develop some passion. So it can be immediate during your MBBS time or postgraduate time. So I developed my passion for head and cancers when I did my ENT postgraduation. And then when you looked at it, see, the uh, getting training in head and neck surgery was not difficult. But when you looked at it, reconstructive surgery was a missing link in the treatment that was being given for head and neck cancers at that time. And that was probably the challenge at that time when you, when you look at it, because as a trained uh, head and neck surgeon from AIMS, I could do any head and neck surgery. There was nothing, nothing uh, questionable about it. But when I looked at it, my challenge would be to get better in reconstructive surgery, which was deficient at that time. And then, so again, I could have gone into some sort of uh, good job. I, in fact, started as a consultant in one of the leading hospitals in, in Cochin, but thought better of it. I had a challenge in front of me. I had a passion, so I had to realize that. So another two years of training in plastic surgery from Medical College Calicut. Then, you know, when you look, back, when you look at it, Training in Calicut was excellent, but you look at your passion, you wanted to become a good head and neck reconstructive surgeon. And then microsurgery was something essential to give, get better in that reconstructive work, which unfortunately, see microvascular, I'll just uh, uh, help you out with what is microvascular surgery. You, you can transfer a lot of tissues from anywhere in the body under the microscope. You connect those blood vessels, very tiny blood vessels of a one millimeter uh, diameter. So this is that uh, photo showing under the microscope you're doing that. And you could 
see this revolutionized the way you reconstruct uh, head and neck cancer defect you could see the top photo is something it takes 3 weeks to 3 months for achieving closure of a defect whereas in a, with a micro surgery you can do it in 3 hours because you can take it and connect it immediately and you have lot of tissues to play with you know you can take bone skin jejunum anything for the microvascular surgery so what was the problem uh, it was available the technical technology was available but no centers offered adequate training in the country for microvascular surgery at that time i'm talking about 1990s um, 90s so got admitted again it was a, it was a challenge and then you have to take the challenge uh, like that and look at the avenues how can you overcome that thought better would be to go to uk and get it trained and so got a uh, stint in one of the uh, institutions and then continued there for 5 years for training and which allowed probably gave me a foundation to become a microvascular surgeon and this is a typical example of a case which i did after coming back to india this is a, a gentleman who had a mandible removed you had a, a mandible reconstructed with the hip bone with the microvascular surgery giving excellent results now when you are passionate you create your avenues of working see you have a you are passionate in head and neck cancer you have to uh, you have to have a avenue to do those cases and then when you came back you had lot of opportunities joining lot of places but when you look at it your passion was in head and neck cancer and then i joined amala hospital in thrissur even though you know you could say that the salary was less and the position was not glamorous all those things plastic surgeon from uk could have got anything in in that at that time so but we could establish one of the earliest microvascular units in the country at that time when when you come back when you when you came back so that was a passion driven challenge accepted type of situation and but when you look at it not one several units are essential for the country in doing it so that was another challenge and one of the questions which i got in an interview in uk was what do you want to go back when you go to india i said i i i had struggled to get a microvascular training so i had to i had a passion to teach microsurgery and then the 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 consultant said is not at all or because i was a, I, i was a sort of senior house officer interview and then this was a challenge and passion so when you came back this 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 lingered and then we when we started the program here in amrita there was a huge potential for that and then the environment was so perfect to get a, a training program initiated way back in 2003 and we have proud to say that we are about 600 microsurgeons trained in this institution from this workshops so uh, that is something which uh, you know it comes out of accepting the challenge and uh, you uh, know realizing your passion then passion created more challenges you have to improve the head and neck cancer care it's not simple uh, you know head and neck cancers are the maximum sort of cancers in the country and only one unit or maybe 5 to 6 units were there in the country doing proper head and neck cancer at that time so there was a lack of trained surgeons and then when uh, we started the institute here along with moni moni kuria who is a cancer center director now in 2003 we started the first structured training program in the country in head and neck oncology that was mch by the amrita university at that time which got recognized by the medical council in 2013 and then we can we have trained more than 50 there are several people who have undergone uh, proper training and heading big units in the country now so now coming to that was a you know overall part of the you know challenges in your uh, profession as a as a head and neck surgeon now being in amrita in a good unit your cases can be challenging and then you will get references from everywhere all over the country even with all the difficult cases and how do you accept these change challenges you cannot say you cannot wash your hands of saying that no no it is difficult you cannot do that how do you accept those challenges the greatest thing you can do to accept those challenges of doing difficult things is to build up a team and it improves the quality of care and allows you to do several things which you would have unheard i'll just take you through few cases and then in my talk see this was a young child with a with a huge tumor in the mandible and she had all the you know recurrent tumor 
and the challenge was to remove it with the you know it was coming in the skull base you have to remove the entire jaw and he sees a growing child and you need to provide a, a mandible lower jaw bone which grows with the age so we took a, a special flap which was reported again a, with with a growth potential this latus dorsi flap two weeks post op i'll take you through that one year and eight years and uh, 12 years see now at that time the rib had grown but it was thin and should in their teeth so we had a couple you know our team then took uh, separate bone grafts and you can see the uh, the implants placed and dent dent dentition given so finally she is like this 12 years after the surgery and how did you achieve it there's a huge team and there is not a single person there who is responsible for the cases it was a team of head and neck surgeon neurosurgeon reconstructive surgeon maxillofacial prosthodon all together another bilateral maxillary uh, defect is one of the most difficult cases in uh, reconstruction so this is uh, she she had uh, a, a, the, the the sample made in the in the lab so this is her after taking the lip and you can see the implants placed and she is uh, at present like this again uh we play you know this is uh, the final picture again the team consisted of all these people so this could be achieved only by close coordinated work between all, all the people in the team the uh, lastly head and neck case this is the huge tumor you can see the huge tumor of this patient and you can see her you know you can see the uh, the eye you can see the eye moving here on the top huge tumor she is a adivasi person from jharkhand and then with the with the team we see this is a huge bony tumor involving the entire maxilla and then we with the old team worked together and then uh, made created the models and this is the this is the uh, tumor which was 4.8 kg of solid bone reconstructed with the uh, leg bone so this is him like that and how did it happen because of only the team effort and team effort of all these people including the philanthropists who helped the patient to come here from uh, you know from jharkhand and social workers uh, hand transplants marwaji uh, sir uh, told about the hand transplants this is a, this was our first patient who had that uh, manu who is um, who was the one who lost the hands and then how do you do the hand transplant this is how you connect those 25 tendons six nerves arteries veins and bones and then 16 uh, 15 to 16 hours of surgery and now this fellow has married his own physiotherapy nurse and he is uh, he has got two children you know one, one child working with us uh, as a transplant counselor and this is uh, abdul rahim who again lost his hands and then he joined back afghan army unfortunately in the combat he died for five years later after the transplant working in the army with with the with the transplanted hands and this is uh, the third one and again uh, i want to uh, go ahead see this was the way the two people with the uh, who had lost both their hands enjoying the life and how did it happen you know the, these things happen and this was a big proud moment for the country because this is the first time in the in the in the in the country's history that this could be done and we were in the league of big time uh, country you know big time institutions from different parts of the world happened only as a team you know team team was there and team could be organized institution experience and microsurgeons orthopedic people transplant a lot of people lot of people and this is the entire team which was responsible for the whole uh, whole uh, hand transplant and above all the atmosphere in this institution with this is the team with the uh, amma uh, you know that that atmosphere and the uh, sort of uh, selfless type of work which culture which we have developed here helped us so to sum up i'm i'm ending here with a couple of slides to sum up develop a passion in your professional life which you will all but don't stop you know don't resist that passion you are supposed to develop passions and you develop those passions pursue the passion relentlessly as uh, marwa sir said it is not very easy and uh, the introduce introductory speech uh, our girl said that 
it is not very easy to pursue that you will have to spend a lot of time it needs time and effort and finally it will throw up lot of challenges and lot of challenges and the one solution for this when you have those challenges is to work as a team build up a team around you in, a, in your professional life and how do you build up a team as uh, i am sure our we have a prime example of uh, dr vishal marwa here who would have been who would agree to that be a good team member then only you can become a team leader there is no way you can be automatically become a team leader you have to be a disciplined team member to become a team leader and there is we against i i did it i i will never say that i did any of this work i will always say that we did it because everyone is important everybody is respected everybody is acknowledged in that in those efforts so that is very very important finally confronting the challenges in the family life cannot be dissociated from your professional life you cannot you should not and it can be different ways in the family challenges this this is a, a picture i always show this is a picture of uh, ardha nadi shara like uh, this is a male half and female half and if you want to be successful you have to have the two bhavas i am not saying that you should be always married but but it should be something like uh, ardha nadi shara and then i had my uh, success because i had one one uh, one lady who who, who helped me to uh, accept these challenges and overcome these challenges and how do you do this this marriage uh, this is a marriage being solemnized in ashram it typifies how you can overcome your challenges in your family life this is that wife would be wife and in presence of amma bowing behind uh, 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 you know in front of the bride groom but you see here the same thing is repeated that boy also bows down and touches the feet of the wife so respect each other support each other each one's professional growth is equally important when many of you might get married to doctors so each is important and give equal priority to profession and family and then challenges are what we make in life interesting what makes life interesting and overcoming them is what makes life meaningful so let me wish you all my young fellows who are listening to this to accept those challenges it is interesting to to overcome them with your effort thank you very much i might have taken 2 3 minutes extra 15 minutes oh, thank sir it was a wonderful lecture actually dr subramaniam ayer you know is a very fine gentleman and in fact other than being an outstanding surgeon he is also a very uh, very good human being because i have personally interacted with him on multiple occasions and uh, i can only say it's a it is very it's a, you know for all amrita institute of medical science it is our privilege to have you know faculty like him and as when we look at he is older than me and we are mentored by you know as i look at it, you know there is a lot of mentoring you know is there is always you know you look around and learn you see it's one of the things which i always tell everyone even my students and i, I always tell it there always there is a role reversal sometimes you know you have to look at the people younger people they will teach you so much actually so many times you know when you interact with them there's so much uh, of inputs coming so pro just keep your eyes and ears open always be willing to take suggestions from all over i think let noble thoughts come from everywhere i think that's very important you know you all this for the students you must have the ability to tomorrow we will be having you know this uh, on uh, the careers after mbbs so dr samson jesudas who is coming from uh, who's from uh, texas tomorrow he was telling that you know one of the things in the trial we had a dry run Few day, two days back, actually, just to see the communication. I, I remember what he said. He says that as an Indian, he says India is such a big country. You, you know, you are looking at people. You know, you can communicate with the accent from Meghalaya, the accent from Jammu, the English from Gujarat, and from Kar- Karnataka, Kerala. He says when he says when I went there, I realized that was probably one of our my biggest, his biggest friend that. he could pick up 
understand the nine ways very well. Whereas otherwise, you were saying that people, you know, find difficulty to pick up the accent of other people. So something I think in a country like India, with such diversity, that also becomes our strength. Now I will be introducing Dr. R. Krishna Kumar, Professor and Head of Pediatric Cardiology at James Kuti. He did his MBBS from the Molana Azad Medical College, Delhi. Sir was selected for the Armed Forces Medical College. He always tells me that, that he joined Molana Azad Medical College. And he did his MD in Medicine from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Then DM in Cardiology from Earls, followed by Fellowship in Pediatric Cardiology from Children's Hospital, Boston, USA, 94 to 96. And he joined AMS in 1998. His clinical focus is diverse because of the unique requirements of the population he serves. This includes echocardiography, catheter interventions, and intensive care. His chief research interests relate to epidemiology of heart disease in the developing world and developing cost-effective clinical strategies for diagnosis and treatment of pediatric, pediatric heart disease in developing countries. He has published over 100 index original articles. He has recently been in, in, included as the internal, International Fellow of the American Heart Association. Again, one of the very outstanding clinicians and stalwarts of the American Institute of Medical Sciences. Personally, I have again had a very outstanding professional and personal level relationship with him. He's amazing. His ideas are phenomenal and I think Definitely, he is ahead of his time. I request Dr. R. Krishna Kumar to begin his deliberations. Thank you, Professor Marwa. I think you spoke about the importance of time. So I'd like to ask you quickly, how much time do I have with this presentation? So I don't want him to, uh, you know, I don't want him to encroach upon the others who are waiting. And there are other stalwarts in our panel. And I want to make sure that the, all of us get to speak. Sir, 12 minutes, sir. 12 minutes. Thank you. That, that, is, that is fine. Uh, so I'll, uh, uh, those, those were very kind uh, words of introduction. Uh, but I think uh, my theme in many ways, what, what I'm going to say will echo and reflect, uh, repeat what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Subramanian here had to say. Um, I'm going to try and share my slides if that's possible. Uh, I think it should be possible. Yeah, there it is. So that's very good. Um, I'm going to share the uh, story of uh, an academic medical career in India. And I think many people sitting in this room have gone through the same in different flavors, of course. I'm sure Dr. Subramani Ayer's career is very similar to this. But you need to see this slide. It's important because you must be having this perception. The one thing I don't resonate with is this conversations people have that doctor's life is miserable, you work all day, you work, your careers are long, you take forever to train and then the rewards are poor, life is, I just don't believe in resonating in with this negative conversation. I think the, doc, the, the life that I've had has challenged me throughout. And the important thing is that you need to be challenged. The day you stop being challenged, I think that's the day where you stop developing. And so I see it as an opportunity much more than as an obstacle. I'm going to just go through my own medical career. So you guys are here at medical school, finishing medical school. And you know, when I finished in my class, 180 people finished medical school. And of those 180, we had this exam called the UPSC exam that could enroll us into a lifelong government service and give us a absolutely cushy job with a guaranteed income and a very good life with a reasonable, very slow, you know, short working hours and a plenty of time to relax. That are, so I think a handful of our classmates went there for that, which was a government job in general practice. And there are some who established practice right after medical school. So they were there. Uh, the vast majority in our college were driven and we chose to do residency and post-graduation. So we had to write the PG entrance as most of you are now in the middle of. And after that, again, you have the option of practicing or going 
for something more advanced. I'm not saying everybody should super specialize, but pushing yourself to get into a fellowship or some level of advanced training, as Dr. Subramanya here just showed you how he went ahead and did the microsurgery fellowship and got this extra expertise that nobody else had. After that, you have the option of going back to practice or going overseas for training, similar to, so I, you know, I also, I'm just telling you, I'm tracing my own journey back as to how I developed in my, in my formative years. So, and you know, it's already like MBBS, you're finished and this is three more years, this is three more years and this is, so you're already six years post MBBS here. And after that, you have the option of going back to practice and somebody will tell you it's about time you settle down. But I chose to go overseas for training. And I think at this point, you are already a little different from everybody else. But then, you know, that idea of doing something special was very, very strong within me. After that, you now that's the ultimate test. Once you go overseas, the biggest temptation is to stay overseas. And I overcame that temptation. And I said, no, I have to go back to my country to serve my country because I'm a pediatric cardiologist. I'd, and there were five pediatric cardiologists, four in India at that time. I was the fifth one. And there were 2,500 pediatric cardiologists in the United States. Now, why should I be one of 2,500? I, I think I have a greater opportunity if, I, if I'm one of five, no matter what everybody said to discourage me, I said, no, I'll go back. So once you come back to India, Typically, when you come back with so much training, you are very valued in the market. So you can actually join a corporate hospital and make a lot of money. Uh, I actually had no option. So I actually joined a corporate hospital at that time um, and uh, because there was no other option. But then I decided it doesn't make sense. This hospital that I'm working for is just for money. We're turning away most patients. So I decided no, I have to go back and go and accept an academic opportunity which came by with Amruta Institute of Medical Sciences. So it's all a question of a journey of swimming upstream. Now these are, you know, which, what kind of fish? These are salmon. Salmon are fish that swim upstream to lay their eggs. They go against all barriers from the sea to the highest mountains and then they lay their eggs. And it's, that's the story. And they are driven by something inward or called, we call it passion. So that's the story of many of us who are, are in Amrita Institute, who have been driven by passion, not really caring about the consequences. We've never cared about what's going to happen, We're purely driven by passion. If you, if you are driven by passion, you won't get eaten by this bear, actually, honestly. It's just an example. You will eventually achieve what you would never imagine you could have achieved. Now, that's essentially the inspiration for me, and I was at All India Institute. I trained in Children's Hospital, Boston, but I was, as Dr. Marwa said, inspired by the, one of the finest teachers of all time, Dr. Tandon, again, in whose name I have actually now written a book. And he is somebody who inspired in a, by example of just the way he was. And he inspired not just me, but generations of cardiologists in this country who then inspired the others. And then, uh, not just that, he was a master clinician, mentor, friend, so much uh, we shared common interests, amazing person who actually said, and I wanted to be like him, even though there didn't seem to be a career option in doing what I was doing. But if you are passionate, you become so good that you will be recognized. It's only a matter of time. So just a little word about why Amrita is special, why Amrita Institute is special. I came back in the mid nineties and most babies with congenital heart disease were dying. 99% of children with congenital heart disease had no treatment. There were only four centers in the country that were able to take care of babies. And they were one in Delhi, two in Chennai, and one, Sri Chitra was actually doing it at that time. Amma somehow foresaw all this. So Kerala, you know, has had a low infant mortality throughout as compared to the rest of the country. In the mid nineties, it was very obvious to Amma that there were many babies with congenital heart disease that were manifesting in Kerala. They were obvious in Kerala, but they were drowned by the other causes of infant mortality elsewhere in India. So Amma felt that there needs to be a specialized center. So she said, no, we need a department 
for children with heart disease. Nobody ever else thought of it at that time. So that was the story in 1998. 1.6% of babies with heart disease were being taken care of. This was when I accepted to join in 1997. I came here and Dr. Prem and Mr. Ron Godsagan, Dr. Prem had a lot of black, actually no gray hair, as you can see. And Mr. Ron, they were very inspiring. They were sitting in a hut outside the hospital and they interviewed me and I saw this building. What made me want to say yes was the sincerity in the, in the people that, that I encountered the first time. I didn't know who Amma was. I didn't know anything at that time but I saw that there is something special happening out here. So I accepted, even though there was no building, nothing you know, really clearly defined. But the one thing that was clear was there was a mandate to serve the average family in Kerala. This was the room I was asked to actually start my OP in. And we started amidst the construction, we moved the echo machines and we actually started seeing patients way ahead of our plan. And you know, it's been a remarkable journey for the next 20 years. Amma was clearly somebody I met for the first time in December. And even then, I wasn't sure what was happening. I just found her very, uh, very difficult to resist and very, uh, very powerful in, in, in her own way and very loving. But I had no idea still. What I also saw at the construction site was the fact that entire construction was happening through volunteer labor force by and large, not so much contract labor. So this passion was visible in everybody who built this institute in its formative years. I think at this point in time, apart from Dr. Prem Nair, I am, I myself, Dr. Anand, I think there are four or five of us who have been there from day one. Uh, one of our very great uh, pioneers at that time, Professor Haridas is no more with us. He was someone who really was driving the force at that time as well. This is the picture at, at the inauguration where Amma, the hospital was inaugurated by, you know, none other than our former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Uh, I joined just after that, about uh, one month after the inauguration that had happened. And it's been an explosion ever since. Why am I telling you all this is that you probably should realize how incredibly lucky you are to be having trained in the institution that you are, you are in right now. Uh, for for the, those of you who are doing MBBS here, it's very rare can you that you will be inspired by something such so noble. When we get something in our hands as a, on a platter, we often don't value it. We take it for granted. I This was my first fellow that I brought from Delhi and we wrote our goals that we have to be accessible to the average child in our region. We have to be cost effective. We have to train and teach at all levels and we have to do some very good research. I can tell you, this is, I wrote these goals in 1998 and what has happened in the next 20 years has been unbelievably, it's been so much beyond what I even expected. And that's true. If you look back in 1998 to think that Amrita is what it is today, it's very difficult to fathom that. So that itself is amazing what has happened. And we do see a lot of obstacles, a lot of challenges. All our day-to-day -day lives are not easy. And you know, this talk that I'm giving to the students, I think applies to a lot of people working in Amrita Institute, that the challenges can really weigh you down, can actually make you feel very disheartened. But you must look back and see what the institution has accomplished collectively. Uh, it has produced an extraordinary environment and treated a phenomenal number of chill patients uh, on, on a scale that you can't actually imagine. Uh, Dr. Marwa, I think I would stop here and except to say that after that, it's been history. At some other point, I can tell what the program has accomplished, but I have to be respectful for others' times and uh, stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was wonderful. And uh, I think, as you said, the time is very important as we have eight speakers. So definitely sticking to the time would be a very, very vital feature. So after two lectures, I think, you know, it will be worthwhile, you know, I think to loosen the environment, make things a little, you know, easier before the third speaker is called. 
So here I think I should, I think maybe uh, say a few things. Like, you know, so I was saying he came and then met Amma. So I, I am a devotee of Amma from, you know, 2009, 11 years. In fact, I never thought at any stage that I would ever come here uh, to work because I was in the armed forces. And coming from a military background, in fact, there have been people who have, you know, rang me, rang me once I joined here and asked me, how, how did you leave the army? Because very people, many people feel, how can this fellow leave the armed forces with his kind of background he had? So, what, you know, the beauty is that, you know, I think it's all a, uh, something like I retired on 2nd November and my family has to be in November of 16 and my family had to stay till 17 within the because of my younger daughter as well. So I was also thinking as to what to do with my wife called me saying, you have been given a mandate to come here. So you please go straight. So I reached here on 9th, that is the demonetization occurred. So and I was in rheumatology and I never thought, in fact, never, the reason I left army, I wanted to probably take it easy actually. There was too much of things were going on. So I thought I'll probably maybe, but then I was then asked to, I was, I could sleep that night as to why do I, why should I become, you know, mm -hmm. made vice principal and then I knew I'll become principal. Dr. Pratap and I, a former principal, told me that you will have to take over. So, you know, I was, you know, thinking, but then again, my wife told me that you do what you are asked to do. I am asked, that is the direction, that is the way to go. So now having finished four years, going to be four years now, I can only say that Amma is the biggest driving force for, you know, a lot of people here. Actually, in fact, Many times I have seen when we are in difficult situation, when we just make a humble prayer to Amma, the solutions emerge. In the middle of an inspection, you know, you find you are thinking as to what to say, just one prayer and the correct answer, we, you know, you find. So, so many things, you know, so many experiences, I think, and this, as you saw in the first two speakers also, that is, I think, the beauty of this, you know, institute. And uh, I think we now move on to the third speaker, Dr. Radhamani K., Professor and Head of Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. She retired from the Government Medical College, Alati, special interest in high-risk obstetrics as well as gyne gynecological surgeries, including laparoscopic surgeries. She was awarded the Best Professor Award in Obstetrics and Gynecology Studies 2019. In fact, I, I think probably I was one of the first persons to learn about this. And this, you know, like many times, you know, people don't even apply for various awards. So I've been, you know, telling my faculty to apply. And I have always found that whenever we apply, we generally get the awards because the quality of work is of such high order. Previous president of COGS. Present executive member and scientific committee chairperson of COBS, coordinator, examiner, and assessor of DMB, examiner and assessor of FNB, and author of the handbook OBS and Gyne for Viva. Madam is a very good teacher. I, I, I know because the students, you know, she is, the, you know, she is definitely on the strict side. You can't get away without doing. You need to have the knowledge skills. I remember once one of the students when I was talking to, he was telling me about, you know, the, the, when I told him, I said, see, if you are, if you are challenged, that's good for you. Then I remember I was doing a rheumatology, my teacher was Professor Ashok Kumar, the senior of Professor Krishna Kumar, sir, in Rams. He was a tough taskmaster and he had very high standards, so, you know. I remember the first article I wrote, Emergency in Rheumatology. It was, I took three and a half months. It's, it was published in GMA. And he told me, this is your first major publication. Make sure it is a very high quality. Because it will be the you know, harbinger of many other publications in future. So it's something like that. You know, This is where we need to understand that the tough taskmasters are the, actually the people who are, or those are the people who are going to push you ahead. 
and getting you out of the comfort zone actually means that that's the time when you will excel and once you have excellence at the ambiguous level it will carry on i request radhamani ma'am to please share her experiences with us Thank you, uh, Principal Goya, Mr. Swabs, and the previous two speakers. Actually, they are among the super specialists, and they present in a super special way. And uh, I, I mean, as far as I am, we actually we are the base people for the young students to educate them and also to mold them. <laughs> and I started my uh, career. We are starting a senior house agency in medicine, and after doing one month of senior house in medicine, I thought I am not a good person in medicine because uh, I was not the courage to face the death in the cardiac issues. Then I uh, then there is a vacancy arise in the gynec. I jumped to gynec and then started my senior house agency uh, in an IMC recognized institution. On the whole, that. the cry of a new born the birth of a new born would be a joyful situation for the family so and the couples so but by time i learned that any deviation from a normal pregnancy is not acceptable to the family starting from still born to pregnancy loss is not acceptable by the family <clears throat> even the worst situation is The death of a woman after delivery, that is not accepted by the uh, family as well as the public and the media, and also sometimes government also raise allegation against the uh, against the doctor or the institution. I have a number of instances, good good as well as bad experiences during my forty years of. Tenure in this medical journey. There are people who praised me. There are people who cursed me also. I would like to say one instance where uh, a girl was brought to me by her mother. Uh, she not uh, acting in Minarthi, and then she would get her menstruation only after some drugs. And on that issue, I detected that she is having. She I diagnosed it as a premature ovarian failure, and then it was revealed to the mother. Later, some months later, the father called me and scolded me that are you a doctor treating the humans or are you a doctor treating the animals? Because of your words, my daughter's marriage is not happening. I said, you be and understand the situation. We find out a way. For her to marry, and also there are now options for getting uh, artificial ART procedures are there. And then scolding me. In spite of that, he on alternate days he scolded me, called me to phone and scolded me. And at that one one time, my husband was there, and he shouted at him, and then uh, told him that if he told him further harassment, he will be punished by means, and we will find a case against you. That means in situations of stress, the family support is very, very important. And uh, <clears throat> another thing is the documentation. That yeah, so in, in case of mortality occurs, so that is when when we compare the medical department and the gynecology department, obstetric department. Is, when a death occurs in the medical medical casualty, maybe due to a serious condition, they may be able to. Adjust to the situation if the treatment is started at the right time. Whereas for an obstetrics or obstetrician, for maternal death, even if we have tried our level best to treat the woman, there are situations where we will lose the mother. There is an acceptable death rate also. So in that in that instances where a mortal to occur, there comes the role of the senior obstetrician to handle the situation because we have to wrap our faculties. And then there comes the team work. We see that the protocols are carried out properly, documented in the case sheet, and whether we have communicated to the public 
I would uh, communicate it to their parents and the family the right way that we are, we are doing the right thing. So here comes the coordination of the coordination cooperation group teamwork. And then there are uh, other instances also where uh, documentation is important in the sense I will tell you the narrator story. Recently, you come across in the media that a king that occurred because of the uh, treatment was not given in a medical college. They actually, what happened is actually the patient was actually in a preterm labor and uh, the HOD told to do the drugs and that. After some time, uh, the, patient, the pain was over and then they requested for a discharge as they would like to continue their treatment in a private setup. But the, the fact that the senior resident on that day duty even documented in the case that they are discharged at request and they like to have their treatment from private setup. So it's not a lot of allegations are against somebody. I How I came to know that because that HOD is a friend of mine, that is why. So these are all the bad reputation in the public. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so uh, another thing is uh, we have to take the decision the right thing. As far as an opposition, I have a good um, a lot number of experiences I faced. And then the right decision, the right thing is also important to save the life of the woman. I will again uh, uh, tell you to narrate a story. So, uh, one of our staff members had a very section by our unit chief in the on a particular day morning. On that day, actually, we had a, a OT and the three theaters were running simultaneously. And then I finished my first surgery and the second patient is taken for anesthesia. While I was waiting for the anesthesia to come, then uh, the meeting me from the labor told me that patient is having bleeding on them. You just come and see because your uh, unit is on the under surgery. While I rushed to the labor room, I told the PG to do a PG and then while the PG was taking out the blood, I looked at the face of the patient's sister, her eyes were rolling behind. That itself, uh, she's in face of hypoxia and hypotension. I ran to, ran to the theater and told, pleaded the anesthetist to take away this patient from the OT, then only I can save the life of that staff nurse. Anyway, the... Um, and I said this obliged and uh, we could save the life of that sister. So I I was always, this is all grow, God's grace, that is the right decision, the right time. So, so that it will save the life of the life. <coughs> then uh, I, my, actually, I started my senior of the I got MD microbiology, and then the uh, pediatrician of that came open and madam. And the cardiologist told me that you should not go for a non clinical subject because actually, at that time itself, I knew the senior was in I had a good name uh, as a clinician. So, I uh, then actually, uh, what I did is actually, I, I had a video from College of Physicians and Surgeons of Bombay after 18 months of senior was in in an IMC recognition institution and the observership at Navarro Shivari and Maternity Hospital, Bombay. I had my laparoscopic training on that time in 1982 from Naurachivari Maternity Hospital and afterwards I worked for four years in a private setup and then joined medical college service in the college I studied. That was actually, I, I was happy in my profession that I had the opportunity to work in the institution where I studied. And also I got administrative position also as CRRA officer and also ARM of that institution and the I, 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 I never thought of coming or leaving LP at any time because I had a good reputation among the public, among the patients and also among the students. And again, in one hour in October only, Amma told me to come and join here. At that time, actually, I was at some, from once I was working in Kishwagiri Medical College, I was actually, even though my students were, my students were students in this college at that time, I, didn't have any intention to come here to really, uh, this is a fact. But when I, after this, when Amma told me, even without a request to join here, that I think it is my way of life then. That's, that is the reason why I joined here. And after joining the luckiest part is, so this is a tertiary care center that's so that there is no need to send the patient anywhere. So we have the multidisciplinary team work. There is a good coordination of the of the other all other departments here. 
and also rare also the very rare rare of the rare of the rare cases come here and had the opportunity to take as well as they, i had the opportunity to see the patients from abroad also because of the marketing i had a good rapport with them patients also they even they called me to come and work in their places like malaysia malaysia and abu dhabi <coughs> and uh, now you can see the uh, one more i instance i would like to tell you we had a case two two years back both indra utra and cervical pregnancy in the cervical pregnancy was on the phase of uh, abortion and that is actually a 42 year old woman after ivo conception what i did is actually to save the uterine pregnancy i did i did a ligation that descending branch of cervical uterine artery and luckily that pregnant sabot and indra had been given syndrome and, and that baby celebrated second birthday and they sent the photo to photo to me and uh, the last week again we had an opportunity we were rarest the rarest business from palm businesses where i was also part of that team and uh, that's the first born baby in india with a palm by a palm based mother <laughs> so lastly i would to say that punctuality and then decision at the right time hard and dedicated work only and then obedience to seniors you know you should have a mentor to mold you to build a skill for a person and then a sympathetic more over a sympathetic attitude of patients also is essential <coughs> and then let me conclude by saying what is life it is within in b to b what is b b is birth and b is death so there is a c in between so c it, it is a choice so life is a matter of choice Do well, do right thing. It will never go wrong. Thank you for that. Thank Dr. Radhamani for her words of wisdom. A very senior gynecologist, and you could see the. amount of experience she has had and basically certain you know core values i think which needs to be we cannot over emphasize you know like punctuality having you know respect for your seniors i think it's very important because this is the way you know the team goes in armed forces cr number you know mr5910 i know that 09 is senior to me and 11 is junior there is no two ways about it and i think that's why you know you may be same batch same day of commission but you know the person who is senior in number is senior to you and he is the he will take the call simple so here again you should be very clear you what do you want to say you tell me at the same time See the workflow. You cannot let it get hampered. Now, I'll request Dr. C. J. Kumar, who is the professor and head of pediatrics at Amrita School of Medicine. Dr. J. Kumar did his MBBS from Government Medical College, Trivandrum. Subsequently, he went on to do his DCH and MD Pediatrics from this same college, Government Medical College, Trivandrum. He joined Amrita School of Medicine in 2016. He has been the IAP Indian Association of Pediatricians Kerala president in 2010 and was president of the Neonatology Forum in 2012. He has many publications to his credit and is a very astute pediatrician, very patient and student oriented pediatrician. He has done a lot of work in popularizing immunization and other important. issues in pediatrics he has worked hard in improving patient and parent awareness in pediatric diseases actually he is in a very when you go to him his office also you will see the way he you know the uh, way he gels with the patients and the family members and he is very popular in fact my staff everyone goes to him only you know that's what i have seen and you will ask the, the children of the staff they go to you know there is a lot of information when i was in command hospital in calcutta my you know one of my commandant general aluwalia he used to say when you are principal or head of an institute there will be lot of information coming to you so you have to filter the information so that time i couldn't appreciate because i was 
and head of a department. When I took over as principal, you realize that in the office, so much information comes. You have to know which one to you know filter and keep to you. So I request Professor Jay Kumar to speak to all of you. I was told by your colleagues to remove this uh, mask. So if I am wearing this mask, the sound will be distorted. Om Namah Shivaya, Pranam Amma, respected medical director and most respected student friendly principal, Dr. Marvasar. My fellow panelists, you heard from illustrious legends in the field, Dr. Ayer, Dr. Kashyakumar, and Asamani Madam. So I am basically a general pediatrician, and uh, I would like to uh, say my journey till I reach this stage from 1976. I joined Gun Medical College to Andrum in 1976, you know, that much before you were born. So that means most of it, you know, your, your 20s, eh? isn't it like that? That means I, 24 years before your birth, I joined Gun Medical College to Andrum. So the moment I entered the first MBBS, my seniors are telling, Oh, I, I, I joined medical college after my BSc degree. So those people who are coming after BSc, you know, that they are considered as uh, idiots. So only pretty students are the best. The one thing they said immediately after that, you put up. Yeah, some say, let me put up. So first time you will fail. So, so this is the way in which they are conveying the message to me. So we took it as a challenge. That was first, first challenge in my life. I took it as a challenge. I start, I start work very hard, studied very hard. And I got first class in the first BBS. Only so you know that those times they they are not not to, not not the people will get first class. Only six people got first class. So that was plus my challenge. So 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 even if people say that uh, you like nobody can uh, measure your caliber. If you work very really hard, I was not an intelligent fellow, but my entire career is based upon hard work. So hard work, hard work, hard work. And as Professor Maro said, punctuality. Then second MB, you know that uh, after the first MB, my the first class uh, caused a lot of trouble because I relaxed a little bit. Anyway, somehow I could manage another first class for the second MB. Yes. And finally, I studied very well. And that also time, I also got first class. So I was among the, uh, one among the six first class holders throughout the MB. Yes. First time, you won't get a, nothing more than that. No distinction, nothing uh, like that. Then again, this first class uh, trouble I admit, because those times, the Admission pattern for the post-graduation was based upon the marks. I was quite sure that I will get an admission for the PG course. So relax during the internment period. Huh? Didn't read anything. So doing simple works and all that. Then and that time, you know, then somebody has given a like, petition, case, file a case. And then that year onwards, uh, the pattern of uh, the admission pattern was changed to based upon entrance examination. So I was quite involved during the first entrance exam. So then I took it as a challenge. Then I prepared very well for the entrance examination and I got post graduation. So my career, my journey was up, down, up, down, like that only. Then uh, after my PG from Toronto Medical College, um, I was posted at a, a medical college call time. You know, that uh, I am from a middle class family, I had a lot of financial problems. That time the income we used to get was only 800 rupees. For a lecture. With that, it's difficult to run a family. Then I was forced to do private practice. So from private practice, you, uh, you will get income. Private practice, uh, with, but the, what is the main problem with private practice? You, uh, you want, uh, cannot concentrate on academics. You cannot concentrate on teaching. So private practice means you have to generate income on your own. But in a way, that's a good. Why? Because if you want to be a good practitioner, you should be an excellent physician. So in that way, private practice helped me a lot. 
So I used to examine patients very well. I used to make a diagnosis. The patients will go to a clinician or a doctor only when he makes a diagnosis. Otherwise, they won't go. They will go to some other place. If you make a mistakes, they will go to other place. In that way, private practice helped me a lot. So I could able to make a diagnosis of so many rare conditions in the limited resources, facilities available in a government medical college. You know, the facilities were very, very less. Even if the X-ray was the only with the difficulty we could take an X-ray. CT scan was not there. MRI was not there. If you order for investigation beyond CBC, routine your examination, you won't get. It will take days. Very first year itself, it will take five days. So we used to make a lot of clinical diagnosis. Examine the patient with the history. We, took, we used to examine the patients from a general examination on the all routine day. We never skip any steps. If here I would like to say that clinical medicine is uh, some, something like a mathematics. So mathematics, you know, the Indian fellow. If you are doing all the steps, you will get an answer. But if you skip the steps, you will lose. So clinical medicine is also like that. If you skip steps, you are a loser. So like that, so I became a clinical uh, clinician only because of my private practice. Then, but in that process, I lost a lot of academics. I lost a lot of teaching. I agree. So uh, I tried for a DM course because at that time DM was uh, available only in neonatology. I appeared at uh, Chandigarh. I cleared the theory and one interview, but subsequent second interview I failed. Then I back came back to private practice because money was a problem for me. So from from that private practice I learned, and then. I joined uh, the optional body known as Indian Academy of Pediatrics. So that gave me a platform to improve my organizational ability, to, disc to discuss topics with the uh, fellow pediatricians. So that made me a lot uh, in my career. I became the president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Kerala State Chapter 2010, became the president of the National Inactology Forum as said, 2012, and, and National Executive Member and National Secretary of the uh, Allergy and Immunology Chapter. Even now, this year also, I'm in, I'm invited to become a member of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics Executive Member. So then, in 2007, I was transferred to Grand Medical College to Andhram, but I never took a leave. There's a practice and that is going on because when you are transferred, people took leave. But I commuted from Kottam to Chuandram every day. So for two years, I traveled four lakhs kilometers. Tell you frankly, four lakhs kilometers I traveled. And then I used to do, I, I examine patients twice in a day, in the morning and evening. I, and I, it is, in all cases, I used to examine on my own. Even now in Avadamarada, I'll take rounds two times in a day, every day. Even, even when I'm off, I'll come over here and examine patients personally. So, so you don't do the thorough examination. The moment I see in this lady, I can know that this is a serious problem. So that draft I have with the patients. So I am very much concerned about the patients. Uh, I used to talk in their own language. So I will never create an atmosphere of ego, uh, concern never as a professor, senior professor, nothing like that. I will talk with them. I am very friendly to them. If, you know, the students know that uh, I will never have the feelings of a student. And then, but to, from 2007 onwards, I developed a passion for research. Your research means original research. So I am not interested in doing research. So when I uh, in the charge of neonatology, one of the most important problems in neonatology is newborn jaundice. Newborn jaundice happens only to normal children. They are admitted in the ward and they used to cry like anything cause disturbance to the faculty. So then I thought, how can I solve this problem? Then I found that our, we are practicing exclusive breastfeeding. So this breastfeeding babies, uh, the gut, gut microbiota is sterile. So if you introduce a probiotic, the probiotic can act and that will help in the problem and jaundice. So I have conducted a study and that was found to be uh, uh, very important and also statistically significant. So giving probiotics to newborn babies is helpful to prevent neonatal jaundice. So that can save a lot of money. You know that uh, the treatment for neonatal jaundice is keeping the baby under phototherapy. So phototherapy means intense light. Intense light means light and heat, and the baby is away from the mother. At a critical time, there the baby has to be with the mother. So lack of bonding, a lot of problems are there. So if you give these probiotics, you can prevent that in to John state and some extent. And another thing, innovative research that I have done was use of 
leave it as a dam in Neanderthal jaundice. Till that time, the practice was to do phenobarbital. You know, the phenobarbital is a very bad drug, I would like to say, because it's caused neuronal apoptosis. That means that will destroy the neurons. But that was a treatment option. But people which will be sedated for hours, you cannot give breastfeeding. So that uh, then I thought of uh, changing that practice and changing to, Levi to start levitrosetam for neonatal seizures. So I started using levitrosetam and that yielded good results. So now in most of the, now people have changed throughout the world from uh, phenobarbital, a very bad drug. So when I uh, came uh, for this ethical committee, the, uh, the concerned person, Dr. Sajit was the concerned person, yes, then why do people change this time, through this time? The, the practice throughout the world even now is most of the hospitals in a from for neonatal as for the newborn seizures. So we changed from that to levitacetam. Like that, in a government hospital, we don't have facility to give nitric oxide for pulmonary hypertension. I started using sildenafil even though that was uh, discussed just, uh, before, much before in this hospital by Dr. Rajiv uh, for pulmonary hypertension. So that view excellent results. Sildenafil is a phosphorylized inhibitor and that's very useful, very cheap management for primary pulmonary hypertension in newborn babies. When you cannot be in a newborn baby from oxygen support and there are no other clinical features, so most important cause is primary pulmonary hypertension and I have used Sildenafil in neonatal John, in neonatal, neonatal RV, and that gives excellent results. So that is original research. You people should develop a passion to develop Original research for the benefit of the children or benefit of the people in this world. So that's uh, one uh, thing that I have done in my career. And then, then what else? So my point is that uh, in 2016, I joined Amrita. So when I com comparing Ramadan Medical College with Amrita, you, here you have excellent clinical facilities. The case that is coming in Amrita is entirely different. You are getting rarest of the rare cases. So if we used to get rare cases once or twice or in an year. But here, every day, every week, you are getting rarest of the rare cases. But my sad point is that, you know, that the students, including PGs, are not making use of the clinical facilities available in this great hospital. If you want to get such a case outside this hospital, you have to wait for years. So, my dear students, one important thing that I want to say that make use of the clinical facilities available in this hospital. See each and every case. Even if it is your post in cardiology or in pediatrics, you can go to surgery, you can go to cardiology, you can go to neurology and see these cases. You won't get a chance to see this type of cases uh, after your posting in this hospital. And also, you have an excellent library. You know that I know the, uh, the practice in our government hospitals. They have used to run open this library for only a few hours. But here, even in national holidays, the library is open. So library is the best place for study. That's the sanctum sanctuary. So my point is that all of you should make use of the library facility available in this hospital. Like that, here you have a, a research facility. So you know that they have given uh, uh, topics for interns. And all of them are presenting. Today, 16 terms presented. One was presenting about the COVID scenario, the impact of COVID on doctors. Another uh, on Indian infant and young child in queuing practice. Another Indian presented the facilities available in this hospital, which our clinics are running. And another one uh, presented about the, uh, uh, so then this, uh, uh, this life skills. Life skills that we should know, how to prevent accidents. So they are all excellent students. They can, so if you give a target to them, so they will obey and oblige. So, and then before I conclude, I would like to say that punctuality is the most important thing. So when I was working in Alipi Medical College, I used to come here from Kota. So to reach in time, I was fined on seven occasions because I used to speed up uh, to reach the Alipi Medical College to start. Uh, my career, my problem, uh, my you know, discussions at eight o'clock, and then empathy and sincerity. You should consider each and every patient as your brother or sisters or parents. Only that way you can improve uh, your career. So, and last thing, don't don't go after money. So that's the last thing. Money will come and money will go, but you know, but never go 
never don't go for money so i am running a charity practice so i started since 2013 now from 2013 onwards i am doing a charity practice at a court time so that will give more dividends so we get the satisfaction by doing charity practice in almost so i wish very best for this uh, uh, students i know that uh, uh, covid is killing so many people but actually covid is killing the young ones they are losing all opportunities i hope that the crisis will be over and you will be in your flying colors best of luck thank you so much thank you four speakers have spoken by now professor jay kumar you could hear he is a wonderful person in fact i have always been talking to him on so many occasions and the best part is you know he as far as a, you know his the students have that you know apart from the patients even with the students you know the kind of chemistry i think is fantastic he is always very positive towards them i think basically i think everything comes you know naturally that empathy is there you know so once empathy is there it is universal you, know? you can't be empathy having empathy for patient but not with student i think it's all a very if you look holistically you know that's what really and what sir was telling about money i think it's something you know you need to have your uh, you know uh, Uh, there are people you know you see I, I am from delhi basically in noida you know, like many people see they ask me sir ya to they charge 1500 rupees up to ya to they charge 350 rupees ya kitna 400 something so i just keep listening because i have no answers for them because i am you know doing what i like and you know, a lot of people think you know that why you are not staying in delhi and why you are staying in cochin so those are kind of things you know you just listen it's okay do what you like two of my students one student wanted to do uh, you know she was very keen to do forensic medicine i had tried requested professor pille the guide and one girl recently she has just finished internship she was keen for doing physiology now uh, i always feel you should you know somebody wants to do pharmacology somebody wants to do biochemistry i think you should do that you should do what you like it's always better to be a you know what uh, the imperfect yourself than being a perfect somebody else i think that's very important in life you need to have your own goals and you know try to achieve them and do what you like because if you do what you like now you are likely to do well that is what i feel i personally and i was you know uh, i was in indo bhutan friendship hospital in bhutan and i was doing well in my career i was major my study you know i got my study leave and i knew i would be very high i would have got cardiology but i was you know i like rheumatology so i was thinking you know so that time i remember one of my friend who was a dental surgeon we were traveling from funchling funchling is you know the base of bhutan we were going to a place we go to a place and near you know uh, and from there you go to thimphu and one road goes to ha So in that journey, you know, like like what he told me, he was from my college, from Joseph's College, where he went to UC, he was junior to me. He told me, sir, why are you worried about the subject? Why don't you think of what you like? Because that is something is you will you know be happy to pursue later on. So I think I saw a lot of logic in it. You know, I it was there were some doubts in my mind, but then I took. So I, I think it's very important. You know what you like. That's very important. I think what Subramanian Iyer sir said. then even later on uh, you know even uh, other all the other specialists have also the hods have also mentioned you need to do what you like because if you don't do what you like then you know later on you may not be happy that's what i have seen and uh, nowadays you know opportunities are tremendous again a point about what clinical examination never there is no question you know of compromising on clinical examination the other day i was you know talking to two of my students you know just they were seventh semester how to differentiate rheumatoid arthritis from spondyloarthritis 
So when I discussed with them, they were looking at loss. Now it's not the eighth and ninth semester which will teach you clinical medicine. Clinical medicine starts from the third semester. In fact, by seventh semester, you should be very strong clinically. What Professor Jay Kumar was telling you, actually, the a very crux kind of thing. Professor Pradeep Jacob, Professor M G K Pillai, Professor Gopal Pillai, they also be speaking. Uh, see, ma'am, see, you cannot. Uh, short change uh, clinical examination i think i remember in the one of the api association of physician of india textbooks there was you know there was a foreword written by an elderly physician he says very few physicians below the age of 50 can conduct a good clinical examination today but that's something which you need to look at you cannot like it's not that you are a 2020 batsman so when you go to play test cricket and you try to hit every ball that, that's not the way it will work out so i think you need to uh, appreciate that you need to improve your clinical skills you need to do good history taking recently i was sent one you know one lecture by one of the very senior doctors must be i think maybe in 80s in cmc velor who has spoken on the importance of history taking because that's a, becoming like a dying art now people don't want they want to see you know the ct scan and mri before they touch the patient i think those are the things you need to look at Anyway, now I would now request Dr. Gopal Pillai, Professor and Head of Ophthalmology and Vitreo Retinal Surgery at AIMS. He did his MBBS at Government Medical College, Trichur, and MD Ophthalmology from AIMS New Delhi RP Center. Fellow of FICO in 2002, FRCS in 2003. He has done his fellowship in McMaster University Hamilton in 2009 and American Academy Certificate course in AMD in 2011. He is a very uh, distinguished ophthalmologist and vitreo retinal surgeon, and uh, is a very keen researcher. He has been awarded a very big project by the it's a multi-centric by the Barack recently, and 18th December was the time he pre- presented at the. Uh, Virat headquarters so i'll request professor dr gopal s pillai to begin his deliberations thank you thank you very much sir uh, first of all thanks to uh, professor vishal marwa sir and uh, our student for uh, making me part of this huge uh, special program and congratulations to the students in conducting the special in this time where sparsh is actually difficult so life's journey is usually for more senior people like uh, krishna kumar sir and subramaniam sir jay kumar sir started mbbs by the time i was 3 years of age so i am much younger uh, but then i thought that there is a difference in the uh, thought process of people who did mbbs about 15 years 20 years before me and the time when i did versus the time when you are doing we as a profession are becoming more and more and more defensive so i would just say that as a child when i was brought up i was seeing my dad as an orthopedic surgeon in a government hospital uh, so he was in the district hospital and he would go to work every day at 8 o'clock and reach home by about 6 pm for lunch and then there would be a lot of patients waiting in the house as well there was a lot of private practice at that point of time just like jay kumar sir said there was need of money also so after that at 10 10:30 myself and my father would go to play shuttle badminton till 12 o'clock and then come home have dinner and sleep and my dad actually uh, uh, had a great impact in my life my thought and i was thinking that definitely definitely i will take up medicine seeing his dedication lots of stories which tells about dedication etc every other night he would have to go for a you know uh, for a, a fracture a fixation or something like that in the night so uh, definitely medicine was in the cards but so that was a that was like one uh, job only there was no other confusion and so i joined medical college trishur and as you know medical education has its ups and downs there are some good memories some bad memories all of you would have gone through that you know in anatomy 70% of us so you should understand that 
uh, all of us would have topped in our own schools would have topped in our own colleges and we would have come through a very high meritorious rank at the entrance there were only 500 seats at that point of time in uh, the whole of kerala and uh, so first time anatomy result about 70% of pain pain fail so that is what jolts you you know that's waking up into the harsh reality of this course called medicine and then in biochemistry our vasudevan sir was our uh, biochemistry professor so he after first average came and told us that you see you have performed abysmally so a lot of people even clapped thinking that you know something good he has told but you know again 75 80% of people fail so but once you started into clinical medicine or clinical surgery the clinical case treasury you know that actually mesmerized most of us actually uh, each of those clinical books like hutchison chamberlain mcleod even indian books like golwala lot of information packed and you know applying the clinical sense so in our case we were significantly taught about clinical medicine like our all our uh, teachers before who spoke before me all of us were into clinical medicine so much so that you know auscultating and picking up you know as ar and if the echocardiographist in some other place said no 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 this is mr then this guy says no no that guy is mr it is not this is asar not mr so that was the sort of clinical medicine and the and our whole brains were grilled into you know auscultating percussing to find out where uh, the dull note was where the uh, semi dull note was all those were the things but things changed and then uh, you see now it is clinical medicine is important but you know facilities in terms of uh, significant uh, imaging all those things are very very important nowadays so after i finished my medicine i wanted to do orthopedics and i wanted to do orthopedics in a very very good uh, location like for example all india institute of pgi or mumbai which they said was a very good place for orthopedics so i wrote the entrance i got into all india institute of medical sciences but into ophthalmology now there was a lot of confusion in your mind you know you want to take up orthopedics or you want to take up ophthalmology at all india institute of medical science now you should understand one thing after after 25 days of my work in all india institute of medical sciences was the all india entrance of that year and in that 25 days i had not studied unfortunately in those 25 days the last year's paper had become you know published as a book now that was time when internet was not available right now if you write an entrance today next day the whole paper as well as the keys will come out but it took one year but those 25 days was the time when that paper came out and when i wrote the all india exam i thought it was a wonderful paper and i had done really well but there were 189 questions a repetition from the last year you should understand that so as young people who are going to write the entrance you know study all the previous papers very very carefully 189 questions repeat so my rank fell down to 300 and uh, so i did not get orthopedics where i wanted like in mumbai or one of the top places in delhi then i asked around should i wait for one more year and then a lot of people said you know you are getting in all india institute it's a great place you do it there it is better than doing you know orthopedics in some other location so some people said no no you should pursue your passion now at the end of uh, you know 22 years after 22 23 years after i did my ophthalmology i understand that there is nothing called passion you have to be better best in what you are doing and over a period of time you will basically like what you are doing so every specialty is really good only thing is you have to you know at least try to be best in that so after uh, you know when and uh, when you are study it is not about a student and teacher it is about a guru and shishya it is completely different you know a guru and shishya relationship is a little different from a teacher and student relationship the teacher gives a class and goes home a guru will often speak to people about their problems about their life's problems they will teach life 
they are not going to teach you you know the subject basically what is uh, what are we actually wanting from a teacher is about creating an impetus for you to learn and gather more information whereas a guru actually catches hold of you and actually lifts you to the next level so that fortunately i got during my residency program and uh, i was uh, i was making the pub presentations of almost about six or seven of my teachers and i was the secretary of the ophthalmic research association there in all india institute so everything was good and the coveted there were 10 people in my batch who wanted one seat of vitreo retinal surgery as a senior resident there were two seats one was reserved the other one was open for the 10 of us plus you know about 100 150 people writing from all the other institutes of the country now i did not get it that time and with tears in my eyes i went to the professor and said sir i did not get the senior residency in vitreo retinal surgery uh, i will i will want to do that so i will do it from some other center then he asked me what is senior residency needed for learning retinal surgery then i thought what is he telling then he said come from tomorrow i will teach you retinal surgery then without any badge without any identity card you know i was there is no official thing i came there and i used to get work every day uh, you know you do this you do that you teach them i was working like a senior resident for some time when one of the other professors who was the hod at that point of time uh, you know called me and told me beta you have to go to uttar pradesh there is one place called sultanpur and you be there you do some community work there i said uttar pradesh sultanpur so it is um, uh, you know it's completely a different ball game altogether but yes i went there so in uh, in um, for two months i stayed in the only hotel of that particular place which is like every day morning the same song woke me up some uh, some radio was there some same song woke me up we went for the community work and came back every day for two months and then the next time the single seat of vitreo retinal surgery they gave me and uh, then you know i moved it then um i want to tell you that uh, i want to tell you a little bit of the health dynamics what is happening right now you know ayer sir as well as krishna kumar sir built a great team but you should understand that in our times about 500 of us came out of the medical colleges and coming into kerala or maybe some 500 came from outside also right now there are about 7000 mbbs graduates who are coming to kerala each year you have to think about it so if you are good in building a team yes you should and how big it should be you know when you have to build a huge team you have to limit yourself to some of the larger hospitals in the country your your uh, choices become a little narrow infrastructure requirements like in pediatrics sir was telling for general pediatrics you require a good stethoscope and good knowledge between the two uh, ear pieces and then empathy to the patient whereas if you want to practice pediatric cardiology or reconstructive head and neck surgery work or even brain surgery or retinal surgery you require more bigger infrastructure is your specialty unpredictable or predictable madam was telling about a lot of cases in which you require to make spur of the moment decisions unpredictability adrenaline rushing obstetrics cardiology cardiac surgery these are all very unpredictable areas whereas dermatology cataract surgery there are predictable areas none of you are alike all of you have different likes different dislikes uh, you know uh, certain uh, taste um, some of you will have some role models you will go after them then it is about what are the costs involved in setting up your own institution versus what are the costs involved in you know uh, setting up a larger institution how would it be if you are joining an institution so those are different matters i would just like to end that you know there are different pathways that you can take so first of all in your mind you should ask yourself what would you like to do 20 years down the line 
would you like to you know do a private practice near your home would you want to join a private corporate institute you know where quantific money is very important would you want to join a government medical college where you can teach but as jay kumar said said the facilities are not as great but it is improving definitely do you want to join government service uh, you know the uh, the not the medical college service but the other government service the only con is you will have to get transfer multiple transfers you can join an academic institution like amrita institute of medical science the number of choices are very narrow to have such good uh, institutions you can do you know post graduation then fellowship in multiple large centers like a lot of them did and then come back and hunt for jobs some people want to go abroad and settle abroad so and finally some people deviate from it so first of all you have to know your strengths you have to know your weaknesses you have to work on your weaknesses and you have to work to your strength you have to know your likes and dislikes and then decide what is best for you all the best to you and may amma guide us in this long journey ahead finally let me tell you that job is not about remuneration it is about happiness and self satisfaction also so whatever gives you a lot of satisfaction and happiness in the long term is what you have to take thank you very much so thank you dr gopal was a beautiful what you saw spoke was so fantastic i really liked so many things what you said actually you know there was what i one of the things i would add on was like what he said was like you may not always get what you like but you should like what you get because sometimes the situation may occur that you are getting a particular specialty you have to wait one more year you know to otherwise so maybe you know you can always make some uh, sort of adjustments and in your thought process and basically eventually what you can go on to do what is you know you can do well in every field there is nothing i don't think like if you are a arjuna can you say that i will only use bow and arrow i cannot use a sword or i cannot fight with a, you know another weapon no you as a warrior you have to be able to so technically all of us should be able to as one should do mbbs nothing like you can't say i can't diagnose appendicitis or i can't diagnose pelvic inflammatory diseases you need to be able to diagnose everything so i don't think we are training prepares us for everything so anyway these are things i think there are a lot of practicalities many a times then you see when i talk to my young friends you know i talk many of them in fact last year one of my student he joined the fo he is now in fact uh, tomorrow he takes over in uh, jaisalmer he was in command hospital bangalore did very well in the covid epidemic and pandemic at the performance in bangalore and in fact one of his uh, one of my one of the group captain mujib who was our you know who has done dm from uh, here gastroenterology uh, otherwise from the armed forces he did uh, his gastroenterology from amrita was his senior he told me uh, sir i must commend you that uh, shrikant has done so well here you know in the uh, covid pandemic so he was you know, like he always say you know like one day he came to me and said sir can we join the services when i explained to him that the boys two of them went for the interview both clear and one couldn't make it because of the medical this guy joined the fos some have joined the army and navy also from here so You see, we all will give you the service though, that you can join after specialization, or you can join then do specialization through the armed forces also. Those options are there. Same with the central armed police forces also. I had the opportunity to do, and I was doing the MD. One of my senior was from ITBP. When I was the head of the department in Calcutta, that time we had two. One was students, one was from BSF, and one was from CRPF. so opportunity the organization will give you an opportunity only thing there will be a little lag but i think one can that's all a matter of 
time, you know, you can eventually you are in a service after all. So all options should be kept in mind when you are, you know, going for a job, even national rural mission, national health mission. You see, these are all where a lot of people are getting employed now. In fact, what I have, I was in an interview board once. And what I observed, you know, for the selection into the armed forces, when you go for an interview, people do not like the guys who have been dropping three years for preparing for exams. Now, if somebody says, I was working in a nursing home, uh, that's taken as a huge positive, actually. Similarly, if somebody says, I was working in NHM, and everybody, any work experience is given value when you are going for these interviews. So, you know, and I personally think you need to strike a balance between your, you know, training and your, you know, so you have to think as to how you will, you know, uh, prepare. So now I request Professor M.G.K. Pillay, our head of the Department of Medicine. Professor M.G.K. Pillay is, did his B.Sc. Zoology from Fatima Mata College, Kollam. Then did his MBBS from Medical College, LFP. MD Medicine for JJMMC, Davangiri. And he has worked shortly in SUT Hospital, Trivandrum and Medical College, LFP, before he joined us in 2002. Professor M.G.K. Pele has got a very large number of publications. He's a very outstanding teacher, very popular, very student-friendly. And he is heading the CRRI. He's the coordinator for CRRI, internship coordinator. In fact, I have seen the humane approach, you know, which he has towards the students. In fact, sometimes, you know, when I have issues where I need to, you know, discuss about something, you know, my own director, medical director, Dr. Prem Nair, then Professor M.G. K. Pillay, Professor Prince Lewis, so many, you know, outstanding people in our setup, Professor Jay Kumar, you know, you will get very good advice, you know, and it's always good, you know, like you need to sometimes take a decision and it can be very challenging. Like, I, I will tell you one of my students, uh, uh, two students lost their parents, father, due to COVID this year. It was a very huge shock for them and we had to be very, very, you know, uh, you know, handling them and then keeping a close watch. You just want to know that they don't go into depression and, you know, it's very important. The best thing is keep in touch with them, keep talking, keep meeting them regularly. And I realized that has proven to be very effective. In fact, the student who lost his father's mother and brother are in the UAE. They cannot come here and he's here. So, you know, there's a lot of responsibility. You are literally a foster parent for them, you know, they look at you and then they tell you that, you know, they have confidence in you. So you have to rise up to match their expectations. So it's, you see, as what was, I think a lot of speakers said that the teachers are not necessarily, as I look at it, are not about only the subject. That's probably, I think, one part. The major part, I think, is the, you know, the values, the work ethics. You know, that is what actually disseminates actually like from dronacharya to arjuna you know that is it is the legacy actually you know you see you follow because i i think that's something which i think all of you should keep in mind and they are very you know the the positive energy which you know comes that is something to see so now i request professor mgk pille one of the most outstanding professors and very humane and somebody who has always been very liked by all the students. In fact, you should look at the claps, the people when they clap when Professor M.G.K. Pillay gives after he is, you know, uh, he gives a speech in the uh, convocation or in the graduation ceremony. That gives an idea. Even Professor Pradeep Jaika, Professor Jay Kumar, they, you know, you get a feel, you get to know how much they are loved by the students. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Humble pranams at the lot of speeches. So we started the panel discussion from Everest. And thank God that you have come to the valley. Eminent professors were discussing, teaching about their achievements and how they have reached the top level. 
Gopal was telling about the change from 30, 40 years to the present scenario. Principal sir was coordinating the whole scenario, situation. And uh, going through all these four decades, what is persisting in clinical medicine? That will be very interesting. I don't think clinical medicine shall exist without a proper medical history. I started my career in 80s. Even now I'm working with my colleague. Of course, team is there now. I was working as a consultant in private hospital. I'll share you some ex experience there. But history is very, very important, I think, in medicine. That is the basis. Communication, if you think communication in all respects, is the basis for everything. Communication with the patient is mandatory. If you have got communicated well with the patient and the bystanders, the present problems that exist, legal medicine, everything can be avoided or it will be a very minimal range. If you are in good communication with the patient and the bystander, I repeat it because that is the thing that is lacking nowadays. We don't have time to talk to the patient and the bystanders. We always work with the computers. Just see the change. So I, I, I can tell you some examples. When I was working in a private hospital near my native place, a 16, 17 year old girl came with dependent edema and anemia was seen by few doctors and was sent for blood transfusion. So when I examined, there was edema in the lower limbs and there was abdominal distension. And taking on trying to take the history, she was not giving the history properly. Somehow the patient was, uh, now I can say she was anxious. That time she was not cooperative. That is the only word I know at that time because it is beginning of my career. And the mother came and something, something was missing there. But when I examined the abdomen, I was surprised because whatever lessons was taught to me by the gynecologist, obstetricians. So it was very difficult for me to say it is not pregnancy. So the distension was secondary to this and she had hypertension, all the features. So without much difficulty, I was able to say, this is a complication of pregnancy only, but you see it is a teenager. So we had to call the gynecologist and ultrasonography showed the baby to the mother. Then only they were able to, then they were telling the truth. See, so a physical examination doubt, a general physical examination created the doubt. Sometimes they may even try to prevent or try to avoid the proper history, telling the proper history to us. Occasions happen like that. And during my career in Alipi Medical College, there was another case of headache and vomiting. So I was a senior intern there. There is no other thing, no manager signs. But admitted two hours before, and before handover of the patient, I just examined because we have to examine the patient and hand over to the next team. So the night duty team, I was about to hand over, I just patted the pulse, it was a blood, there was bradycardia. Again, I look for raised ICD something because with minimal knowledge, no, I didn't get it. So I just told the assistant professor, he simply told, maybe it is an odolum poisoning. So put a rice to surprise to see. Uh, just pieces like mango fruit, green, small pieces. Subsequently, everything was clear. She consumed, she took one fruit. There, the history was very important. Then another case, similar one. 
headache minimal headache altered sensory means sleeping fresh the sleeping so last 12 hours she was sleeping morning she did not uh, uh, take the food she was omitting so clinical exam did not conclude anything and finally by the evening we got the history it was a phenobarbital poisoning so why i am telling all these cases is because these are the cases that may even create a lot of trouble in your professional life but if you are examining the patient when there is no answer so first examination is conclusive okay if it is not conclusive we will continue the examination till you get the or means when i put the rails tube and aspirated the diagnosis came out because a rice particle like means aripodi wall materials white powder was in the rails tube aspiration so then again the questioning she told she took tablets see no other clinical sign so if it is a hospital with all set supports infrastructure it may be easy but india you remember full set up hospitals are even now only a few percentage very few percentage you will be going into the community working with the common people just like uh, previous uh, speaker radhamani madam and go back telling with a very minimum facility in alp medical college i started my career and main weapon was clinical examination with a background of good medical history and another case after coming to amrita things became very easy when lady came and she told a good story the main problem was fatigue but she told a story that she went for a tour program to kulu manali and other thing then immediately the bystander husband and her brother told no sir we never went to that place what is happening she telling like that and going through some of the thing i i was able to tell possibly this has got something inside the brain and ophthalmology examination gave a report the papillary image there so this confabulation type of pattern means history was supportive for a diagnosis of a frontal lobe tumor see the history so if you know if you are aware of the things which pin points to a diagnosis that is why sometimes history is complete sometimes history may be only supportive some cases history you may be difficult to extract but remember that is the foundation of medicine that will continue see in america because of the huge burden of uh, investigations they were doing and the difficulty in getting the reimbursement back from insurance companies they have insisting to back go back to clinical medicine and send only necessary investigations so i don't think we can dilute that part so once you are able to collect the history documentation is most important because legal medicine also is advancing if you are not written it is not taken that is the supreme court advice if you are not documented the history you are not taken the history that means you are punishable so this late hours i don't think we can do a lot of post mortem of cases and tell you more and more about this but if you want happiness in your professional life we should be systematic in history taking systematic in general examination and system examination and sending investigations based on requirement only if you start with investigations if you depend on laboratories you will be in trouble so let us live a happy life by doing a systematic work again i tell you your personal life and professional life both are important so you have to balance both and the the means whatever work you are doing whatever peace you are getting you have to share so your colleagues in so your relation with your colleagues also very important a healthy relationship in the hospital a team work and i told you repeat you a systematic approach 
this will help you to come out in colorful ways so thank you very much thank you thank you sir it was indeed very well covered the importance of history taking i think cannot be overstressed i think the present generation needs to be very careful they must understand that history taking and examination when i remember reading one article i think about maybe 7 or 8 years back that said that history taking and clinical examination actually the contribution is actually beyond 75% 75 to 80 82 percent you know the other thing is contribute only 18 percent 16 percent what sir was saying i think if you would appreciate was that you should do the relevant investigation you don't have to do everything on earth to you know finally you should know what are you looking for that is very important and i was doing my rheumatology and i just early few months i think and just about three months into my training in rheumatology at ams new delhi i remember there was a lady who was sitting in a wheelchair and you know i was shown the x ray by my i was called to another room basically just to show that case so basically i i didn't know i couldn't diagnose actually the loose zone and the patient had osteomalacia osteomalacia and uh, you know so it's very important that you know you it is you know the history is very important all those things if you don't then basic investigation like an x ray otherwise you can have 100 reasons why somebody is having proximal muscle weakness but then you have to be able to put the yes. clinical radiological correlation and diagnose the condition correctly so we move forwards the next to speak will be professor prince louis palati she is professor and head of pharmacology at amrita school of medicine aims Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences she did her MBBS and MD from Goa Medical College she joined us in July 2018 prior to this she was professor and head of the department of pharmacology at Father Miller Hospital Bangalore she is an avid researcher she has significant publications as an author of books and various chapters and books she is a UNESCO chair in bioethics she is an authority on bioethics and has conducted many webinars and conferences you see ma'am is a very uh, you know is a very unique kind of personality actually it's been about 2 years that you know i've been knowing her she has uh, you know one thing which really stands out about her is you know the uh, her uh, lateral thinking i think that's what i would put it she can actually go beyond the you know normal thinking that's something which i which is not everybody is not very easy and that's why she was able to you know go into other things the probably that is why she could do bioethics and you know move into that sphere also a very uh, uh, good teacher and very popular with the students and very popular with the pgs also i know her post graduates like the very uh, you know the way she looks after them and you know the Where she is guiding them and encourages them to take part in various other various various studies. In fact, uh, it's it's been a, as far as I look at, you know, she is. I'm sure there is hardly if I have to do something with some, you know, there is some innovation or something or something new. I would definitely like her viewpoint because I know it will be definitely useful and which will take us forward in that direction. So, Professor Prince Louis, ma'am, request you to please. my respects at the uh, humble feet of amma i thank our uh, director dr prem naya and i thank our very pragmatic and practical principal the colonel dr vishal marwa for giving me the opportunity to share my life experiences from which i hope you will be able to take something from it as always you and i we have had a dream to be a doctor some right from my fifth standard got a little um, uh, you know toy set a doctor set and you know my grandfather was a doctor so all that came to be
answered any entrance exams. <laughs> Lucky me, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, so when we got into MBBS, but we had to get the marks in the 12th standard. So I got cut off at from the MBBS in 1983 just for the 0.7. You know, I got 77.6 and the cut off for 60 students, uh, 50 that is, and 10 were, you know, government seats to two. I got cut off at 7.6. 7.7 got. And uh, my dream of becoming a doctor was lost. Have you faced this kind of a situation? Hmm? It's okay. I am a survivor. I got to. And I did dentistry. I got engineering. I got other things, but I took on dentistry. So I am in the medical field only. So I was doing dentistry quite happily. Completed the year with the, uh, you know, anatomy, physio, biochemistry was together and got uh, two distinctions to my, you know, under my uh, arm. And I was happy. And just a long while, go to see the, it dips, you know, the selection criteria dips. And as my parents are very, very, you know, they are the guiding force, they had put my application again for the next year. I never thought, you know, I mean, I didn't think I should be so lucky to have all my wishes fulfilled. But the next year, wonder of wonders, it dips, and I get in uh, into the medical college very easily. And behind me, one more uh, student also, because it dipped to 77.5. And so here I am in the <laughs> medical fraternity, as you see. And uh, as I went through the MBBS, in second year MBBS, I thought the subject pharmacology was the one that would again stop my dream of becoming a doctor. And at that time, if you told me that I would be the professor and HOD of pharmacology, I get drop dead if you had just touched me with a feather even. Hmm? So that was the state of affairs. Uh, but I did get through, there was no problem, and we got through. And uh, just as I finished my MBBS, I got married to this wonderful person who is, who is the support of my life. If I am anything today, he is there behind me always. So as I finished my um, writing of the exam of MBBS, and I had to join uh, for my internship. I finished my internship and then came the next choice. So I still, again, we didn't have any entrance exams, but we had uh, something that is, you know, we take the best uh, of aggregate three marks, uh, aggregate three years per marks, plus the subject that you're looking for. Unluckily, you know, my surgery, I do not like surgery, oh, no offense. Uh, to all the surgeons. Surgery was not my good field, but I got wonderful marks in surgery because I was good at drawing all beautiful chaurasia drawings. Everything used to come in the surgery paper. But medicine, my favorite, I love medicine because of its vastness. And I love medicine and pediatrics. Both were taken by my friends who topped it. And I had got, uh, I got MS surgery, but I took MD anesthesia because and not the surgeon guy. Anesthesia is a different matter. I was quite happy, but when I took anesthesia, I was, um, you know, seven months pregnant in uh, June, and then I joined, and I thought this uh, um, anesthetist actually, he would put me in the, you know, OT, and I don't know how I will say no to him, because he was a very, very, um, you know, bombastic kind of person and no one would talk to sir uh, anything but you must underline that we uh, we are prejudiced we think that they do not know don't you know that i'm carrying definitely he's an anesthetist definitely he's not going to put me in the ot but at that time with my little mind it didn't strike and i thought hmm, let it be as it goes you know and wonderfully he put me in um, I had to be in the ICU and I had my duties 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then uh, I delivered and I came back and then I was in OT duty and it was really rigorous. So um, June, July, I joined and by December, I decided to leave MD anesthesia because I have a husband who is an engineer and he, given my husband's choice, 
he would rather have me, uh, his wife to be a 10th standard pass because elementary education he wants, but not more than that. But I should be there at home seeing everything is fine. So keeping a compromise of both things, I thought we would leave and I would take a alternative. And there my husband and I, uh, uh, we sat around looking. So medicine and pediatrics, I wouldn't get, you know, that's out of 10. So next what? Dermatology. This husband of mine saw dermatology and we is a no, no, that's not for us. Then radiology. Radiology, no, no, you'll be radioactive, out of question, very dangerous. Then like that, we came to anatomy, physiology, and at pharmacology, he said, right, and I said, also, that's fine. I mean, I didn't know, you know, I, I know it is a mugging subject, and you know, I was just wondering. And then I joined in pharmacology. And then there was no looking back. Today, I don't know what I could have done better. It is suiting to my taste, my ways, and it gives me the extra time to extend into so many other aspects. So I am in medicine. I am in it, but out of it. In the information and knowledge of medicine, but out of the night duties and the calls, etc. So I, I think I've got it. <laughs> I got it made. Uh, it's the way we take it, right? But I am really happy doing what I'm doing. I couldn't do anything better. I mean, I just can't know. Otherwise, I should have been a raw agent uh, other than MBBS. <laughs> okay. So this is what I have come to being in pharmacology. And I had such wonderful teachers like our dean and the HOD of the department that was Dr. Dean, Dr. G.J.S. Abraham. He was a wonderful person of pharmacology. And he was also the Toastmaster at my wedding. And uh, it was a wonderful learning from him. And we had Dr. Vishwanath Ji Dhumi, who was the next HOD uh, as I was studying my um, MD pharmacology. And I learned a lot from him because these senior professors, my guide, Dr. M. V. Akshikar and Dr. Vishwanath Dhumi, they used to read every letter of the Goodman Dhumi, that's a Bible Gita Quran, and they used to find out, you know, or any journal. They used to read the sentence and they used to try to uh, learn the English, the grammar, the interpretation of these sentences. So that's how I got into the depth of things, you know. Um, when you see in a journal, you know, like somebody is trying to hide something or, you know, hype up something, you know, you can immediately see because I have been taught uh, to look at each words and how it can be interpreted. So I have a lot to lay at the hands of, at the feet of my teachers, and they have taught me well. If my principal has said some good things about me, I'm not totally deserving. I had wonderful teachers, it's the only reflection that I could be saying. Thank you, sir, for that kind introduction. So, uh, and also, I would say being in pharmacology is wonderful. You can be an academician that you want to be, or you can be in the industry. And I have my uh, you know, students that have gone through me. I give them the opportunity. You know, I just don't, I'm not talking only about my PGs, but the MBBS students sort of they gravitate to me. I don't know. Uh, maybe the mother look in me. <laughs> I do not know. But they do ask. And, you know, there are some who are being forced into medicine. And I say there is a... happy you are happy all of us win-win situation so that is uh, also another aspect and also making do you know there are these so many students you know being an academician has brought out a lot and i am today if i am uh, despite my obesity and everything i am uh, always feeling young at heart i don't look as i look with all this gray hair it's not as bad I still feel 30, 25, 30, <laughs> okay. So that is by the students around me. Another aspect which I would like to tell is one of my MBBA students, he is an entrepreneur in a doctor's court. Hmm? So don't throw it out. You be what you are. Be frank with yourself and do the best of it. So he went out and did a, a pharmaceutical management and now he's running uh, one of the top uh, firms in the, along the along the glo as a global head so the opportunities are many choosing what you like and what you want 
And as uh, uh, we started this session with Dr. Subramanya Maria and a quote by Dr. Krishna Kumar, the whole thing is you do what you like. And as Dr. Jay Kumar said, don't look for money. Money will come back. It will come as you make the right choices and you do the right thing and you're on the right track. Money, fame, all that will come in line. You don't have to look for money, you know, it comes to you. So just doing what you are, you're happy with what you have. And uh, friends, uh, being a woman, you have to balance, I mean, men also, women also, we have to have our life partner and our children. It's lonely if you're just career minded, you know, and you get the best of everything when you have both the things well balanced. So friends, um, I do not know what you can learn from my thing, but I had a still when I, after I finished my, when I was doing my MBA, I was staying in Vijayanagar colony in Kurlin. And I'm known there as Kurlin Chibutur, doctor of Kurlin. And because I'm a woman, although there is in the colony another PhD doctor having his private practice in this flat, people started coming to me because I'm a woman and children and women started coming, and then men and everyone started coming, I had to partition off my front room. And I started getting so many patients without uh, till date. Uh, and after when I finished my MD, I had to join some CMO post till I got a major, you know, uh, uh, to do something, uh, wait for the PSC posting, GPSC posting. So. I was in three, uh, I had first child, now I had my second child, so we were planning on it. So my husband said, don't join for any of the short posts, you won't get leave when you need. So I continued my private practice. It was so wonderful. I do not know how much I went. Only my husband at the end of the month, he would look at my register and make the total things. And there is all this mod. Always, the, the drawer is always full. <laughs> uh, that is one good thing. But I learned being in private practice, who comes through the door next? That is always a question mark. So, yeah, in that time, the, uh, the Konkan Railway was having its work being done, and there were so many labor contractors. They have under them some 160, 150 people under them. And uh, because I know languages, yeah, friends, note to point to note, I can speak many languages. And some of the languages like Kannada, Kannada, I learned in Goa itself by my Kannada patients teaching me. You know, so I could, uh, Odia was a little difficult for me, but otherwise I could get many of the languages across. And that was a really good point for me to have a very good practice. And friends, that is without income tax. <laughs> Another point to note. Okay. And uh, so what used to come through was, you know, uh, you have read Bailey Love, you have read Hutchinson's, you know what cases to expect. Here, one day the door opens and there I have two men who are just dumped in 100 kilo of clay mud. Have you read this in Bailey and Mud? How to handle it? So there again, you go to your critical uh, ABC and all that, and there you have it. And it went right. Then I had, uh, there, uh, there is, uh, you know, one day, 7 a.m. in the morning, squeaking child and father and mother comes in with the child, but he's caught in the zip. Mm -hmm. Did you learn? Uh, well, now, if you've seen, you know how to handle. So all of these wonderful things coming through, and it keeps your critical judgment, critical thinking at the fore. And always, you know, if there is so much satisfaction happening there, it's, uh, you know, when I come back at five, because I was regular, because I had to go to GMC and come back at five, five thirty, I would reach back home, I would have a whole line of patients waiting for me. And I couldn't drink my cup of tea, you know, evening cup of tea when I come back from my work, I cannot drink because I had a whole lo load of people sitting on the steps because it's a flat. I didn't feel it right. And I used to see them all and by about 9, 30, 10, and then there used to be knock. And there are these women in the industrial estate, some from Kerala and all, you know, they shrimp, uh, they open up the shrimp and that is for export. These women will come by their, with their uh, contractors only in the middle of the night. And this is all you, know, you have to see and be careful of the MLC cases, in, importantly, reporting and all this. It's a beautiful experience to have just clinical practice. Pharmacology aids your clinical practice. You have academia open to you and you have the whole of, the whole of uh, uh, 
industry and you find ways, whatever. You can do sitting it here in a college, you can do scientific writing. You know, you paid money. It's just extra points, you know. Or you can be in an academy taking classes. They asked me to take 100 classes. I didn't have the time and you know, I had so many other commitments. I didn't find it right. So opportunities are killer. So friends, just take the positive points from my uh, life story and you should bring it to a culmination of your own. And that is what will give you and achieve the satisfaction, the dedication, and the passion. You should have passion in you, and that is what radiates to those around you. And with this, I would like to end. All the best to you all, whatever you choose. Keep at it. Don't give up. Survive in everything. Thank you all. Dear friends, as I had told you, Professor Primsi Lewis Palati, she is Ivy League. Not in Ivy League, Namrata, but Ivy League. I'm quite sure had probably she gone to US or something, she would have been, you know, somewhere in Harvard or somewhere. So that's her caliber is a very high order. So I have always, whenever I've discussed, you know, I, you know, the way she moves, her thought process, and I, I told you, lateral. I used to hear what is lateral thinking. She's an example who can think of far beyond actually. And not very many people, not very many doctors I've seen who can, you know, think beyond their subject or, you know, who can. But even when you would have seen, she exemplified that in her talk also. She was able to touch various aspects, you know, of human relations. I've always told you repeatedly in this journal that, you know, you are learning from, you know, you learn from your teachers, so many things, you know, which are, you know, you need to, uh, their personalities, you know. I personally was in the army, and I remember there were guys who had, whom I didn't like, actually, the, my heads, my, you know, unit commanders. Not only liked, rather I would use the word disliked and probably hate at times, or even poor work ethics and and you know what happens in an organization you know, where the like army, you know what happens, like Hitler. He, Hitler became in you know, power in 33. And you saw the Second World War, 39 to 45. And he could have rested after taking some parts, but he went to Russia also. And that's where he finally got defeated. There's a saying, it's not the Russian winter defeated. Hitler, not, you know, so if you read the World Wars, you know, you'll realize. Like the Afghan war, the first Afghan war, the Afghans defeated the British very badly. Auckland's folly, if you read history of, you know, the, the time it was British India. So, wherever you, you see, it's as a leadership is very important. You will be leaders, definitely at some stage or the other, let me tell you. Head of department is a leadership appointment. Principal is a leadership appointment. Medical superintendent, leadership appointment. Then you will be, if you are given, you are heading a committee, you are actually in a leadership appointment. So even unit chief is a leadership appointment. So very sooner or later, and if you are a young person, you go into national rural health mission, national health mission, you will be a leader at a very young age. In the Indian Army, as a captain, you will be OIC of an advanced dressing station, you are leader, you are heading that. Or major, you know, where major is a company commander in the Indian Army. Now major oblique left field colonel, but most of them are majors. They are the guys who, you know, lead the operations and all over. What do you see happening? You know, what do you hear? So and so, captain, so and so, major, young people, you know, that is, they are the ones who lead. So, leadership is there at every stage. You have to develop own leadership. Tomorrow, in fact, we are discussing leadership will be one of our major, in fact, uh, agenda tomorrow. In fact, today, when uh, Rear Admiral Arti Sareen, Madam, she spoke in the morning. She was telling that, you know, unfortunately, our medical thing, you know, they are not training us for leadership. I did a basic course in leadership in the armed forces, then a junior command, then again a senior command before I became a full colonel. So you have to, you are taught what is expected and, you know, the basic tenets of leadership. That is very important. But 
unfortunately, they're not taught. But it is very important. Like soft skills, people have realized the importance of soft skill. Now, soft soft skill. We have soft skill in faculty. We have one. Recently, he was there. I saw last year. Very beautiful. I attended a class. The way they conduct so much, so beautifully. You pick up actually. So small things, you know, like what Prince Ma'am was saying was so vital. Like how you deal with the patient, how you talk. You know, it's uh, if you don't use the correct. nomenclature the correct language i think that's where you are you know success and failure actually very very defining the dividing line is very thin you need to understand so friends it's very important that you you know you there must be a holistic development of which is very important you you should develop holistically physically fit in fact she was telling very correct physical should spend some time you know it's not be totally you know lying on the bed and go home no you know you can you can always spend about you know half an hour on your body it's a bit of 45 minutes every day go for a run do some static exercise do yoga so many things are there to keep fit but do something don't just you know while away and it start you know with some back problem at you know 23 year old person having the back problem or that 25 people are struggling with multiple you know uh, diseases at 30 below 30 you are hearing hypertension diabetes so many things lifestyle disease striking young people heart attack at 33 all these things are not uh, indicative because you have to eventually be fit if you ever do tell you one thing na you must concentrate on your health all of you dr george is here you know he always whenever i get opportunity you know second to fifth floor i always take the Rarely I take the lift because he always says, "Sir, I go, you know, to eighth floor in up and down." You know, that's like motivated us actually to take the stairs. So you know, I think that's something you got to you know do in your life. Uh, physical fitness could never neglect physical fitness. It's very very vital. Now, we are not no no sessions on physical fitness, but very important. That is the thing which you know takes you and if you see. Watch by and all you know they were at eight seventy eight eighty they were you know prime minister of the country even Morarji just say it and only because the fitness is there they can be in that you know position Manmohan Singh he still you see eighty seven eighty eight I think now Advani is ninety if I'm not wrong still he is not in a wheelchair he is walking he walks straight so fitness please do work on it all of you very important good point madam made. now i will actually just you know i don't want between the speakers there has to be some gap otherwise you know you will not be able to um, assimilate what you should assimilate from a speaker dr pradeep jacob is our head of gen surgery he is mbbs and his ms he has done in gen surgery from government medical college kottayam has been with us from 2002 Special area of interest is thyroid surgery. Very passionate about teaching. Has many national and international publications. Very popular teacher. Has done very well in academics and research. And he is the I Q A C coordinator for Amrita School of Medicine. And as I told you, is you know again is one of those students because the feedback which one gets, you know, the amazing teacher actually. They're all. one of the probably most outstanding professors and teachers of amrita institute of medical sciences professor pradeep jacob hey we always say be best for the last uh so we've listened to seven great teachers talking about their life journey challenges that they faced in their careers so i'll over the next uh, 10 minutes i'll just quickly take you through what you can expect uh right from when you join your mbbs to establishing your own uh, career path in the future like uh, dr gopal pille mentioned all of us have excelled in schools have been toppers 
when you join your uh, medical school. And uh, then reality bites hard. Uh, you are just one among a crowd once you come to medical college. You're faced with too many subjects, frequent exams, and uh, it, it becomes a little difficult to balance this sometimes. Many of us have our own different ways of studying. Some prefer to study alone. A lot of, uh, a lot of us prefer group study. So that, that is all individual choice. I did not have a choice, uh, unfortunately or fortunately. My sister was my batchmate, so we always studied together. And uh, I, I, I found that over the five, five and a half years I spent in medical school, she was a constant companion. So it always helps if you have this uh, group study, uh, helps you to cover portions much faster, retain stuff. The uh, only disadvantage there was all the girls in my batch considered me that I was a universal brother of the batch. So it did have its disadvantages also. And then after the initial few years, you go into the clinical postings and that is when a, a whole new world opens up. But there again, you find many of the bright students uh, being uh, weighed down by insecurities. Am I the only one not hearing the mamas? Am I the only one that is not able to palpate the enlarged liver or the spleen that the, uh, the, the final PG or your professor has uh, so, so uh, demonstrated in this patient? So there are a lot of insecurities there and many, many classmates of mine have opted to take a non-clinical uh, subject just because they thought they were not good at picking up clinical science. So no one, no one is born a clinician. These are all skills that you can develop over the years. So once you finish your four and a half to five years of uh, medical education, you go into internship. And this one year internship is, is a time that you can use wisely to choose your career path. Before I joined my internship, I thought I wanted to take pediatrics. One of the reasons is because my teacher is sitting here. I thought I, I, I liked children, but then after having done my internship in pediatrics, I realized that I liked healthy children and not sick children. <laughs> So, uh, otherwise I might have taken pediatrics. My sister eventually did take pediatrics. That's a different story. But I, I knew that I could not manage sick children. I could not manage parents of sick children. I, I think pediatricians do such a wonderful job in managing uh, the sick kids and their parents. Uh, at the start of my internship, if someone told me I was going to take surgery, Again, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have believed them because when we started the uh, medical school, we were taken on a, on a tour around the hospital. And one of the places that we were taken to was a blood bank. And there were three or four people lying down in the blood bank donating blood. And at that time, they used very large needles. And uh, uh, I just watched one needle being put into the cubital vein and three of us fell that day. And uh, I must say with some amount of pride that I was the third person to fall on, 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 on seeing blood being withdrawn. So uh, from that time, uh, first MBBS falling down and seeing blood to taking up surgery as a, uh, as a postgraduate subject uh, is, a, is a long way forward. But then uh, once we started our surgery posting and uh, we were given chances to assist in the theater and in the minor procedure room. And I must uh, give credit to my teachers for, for encouraging me. And a lot of us are inspired by good teachers. I was blessed to have wonderful teachers in surgery. 
I should mention uh, Dr. Raidhanathan, Dr. Shankar, uh, Shankaran sir, uh, Gobalakrishnan sir, who I'm, I'm still working with. So they've all taught me from my MBBS through my MS as a as a as a early uh, in my early career as a lecturer. Even now as head of the Department of Surgery, I'm I'm very fortunate to work with my teacher, Dr. Gobalakrishnan. So. We, we are all very thankful to all our teachers who have nurtured us from our early days. This one year of internship, what I think has happened in the recent uh, few years is people cutting work to prepare for the meet. I don't think that one year that you do your internship is one year wasted. There are very few of us who can balance good work during internship and preparing for meet. Even if you have to wait for a one additional year, the one year that you spend working in the different departments along with experienced consultants, will definitely throw light upon the path that you would eventually end up choosing. So these five and a half years in MBBS, these are probably the best days of your life. The road after that is going to be very narrow and winding, not a bed of roses. So treasure these five years. It's not just academics, the co-curricular activities, the arts festival, conferences like this that you get a chance to organize. All of this enrich your, your journey. So all work makes you a dull boy. So work hard, but play hard as well. The friends that you make during your MBBS days are the friends that will be with you the rest of your life. I, I studied at Cotton and I'm proud to say that every year after we completed our internship, we still meet up somewhere in Kerala, sometimes in Cotton, sometimes in Cochin. It might be not all hundred of us, but even if it's just 10 of us or 20 of us, we make it a point to meet every year and catch up on the good old days. So once you've decided which way you want to go, where your passion lies, prepare for your need, you get through into your post-graduation. You need to be willing to learn from everyone, anyone. I, I still remember as an intern, the person who taught me to put my first futures was not my professor of surgery. It was a it was a grade four worker who was working for the last 20 years in the minor procedure room at Cotton Medical College. Chako Chetan, I think his name was. He was the one who told me this is how you put your sutures because you're in a busy government setup. You're just pushed into the procedure room with no one to guide you. And we had a mass casualty that day, 50 people brought in, uh, two buses collided. There was no one to hold my hand but Chaka Chetan. And he was the one who told me, this is how you put your glove. This is the future material that you need to take. So you can learn from Chaka Chetans. You can learn from the, uh, the scrub nurse in the OT. She has 10 or 20 years of experience working with Senior surgeons, and uh, 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 when you start your surgical career, I don't think there, are, there is room for egos there. You learn from whoever has more knowledge than you. A lot depends on where you train. I've trained in a government setup, and at the time when I did my training, the, the facilities there were not as great as it is now. So we're used to operating 
without three lights shining above your head, lights that are adjustable, tables that can tilt any way. We've stood on boxes and operated because the tables would not go down and I'm not very tall. We've operated with torches being shown over our shoulders because for the generator to start, someone would have to go to the nearest petrol pump to get diesel. And also the money for the diesel would come out of our pockets as well. So these are, these are trying times that we've had when we had our training. So we used to go working in different difficult circumstances. When you train in a, a center of excellence like Amrita, one of the disadvantages I see with the current generation of surgical postgraduates passing out is that they are not used to working under extreme circumstances. If you push them to a, a primary health center and ask them to operate without uh, state-of-the-art uh, OT facilities or the like, they might struggle. So I think we should all realize the ground reality. We may be working in uh, a, a hospital, a tertiary care center, or a state-of-the-art medical college where you have all the facilities. But when you go out, things might be different. So we need to be prepared for that. I've spent almost 13 years as an MBBS undergraduate student at Cotton, then as an intern at Cotton, then three years as a postgraduate in general surgery, another two and a half years after that as a, as a, as a senior resident. And at no given time could anyone differentiate whether I was still a student or a PG or a SR because all of us were prepared to do anything that benefited the patient. Even if we, as, a, as a senior resident, we would push trolleys into the OT, out of the OT, into the recovery room, because we did not have time in between cases. Anesthesia would run only till 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, and we need to get as many cases done during that time. We would go to the ward at all odd hours, complete all the dressings that need to be done. So, as you rise up, in, the, in, in, your, in your rank, I don't think you should still shy away from doing basic clinical work. Don't delegate history taking to the junior most. The history taking can be done by the professor or the head of the department as well. So the, these are work, work ethics that you need to cultivate over the years as you grow. Why did I not take up uh, a super specialty? Do I have any regrets about that? It's something that many people have asked me, a question that I've, I've got fed up answering. I wanted to stay back in a teaching institution. And I thought if everyone after general surgery were to take up super specialization, there'd be no one left in general surgery. A general surgeon is, is an extinct commodity now. Very few people are staying back. But then, I don't think you will have super specialists if you don't have general surgeons. If someone, someone has to stay back, and I, I hope some of you listening to me would also think about staying back in general surgery and training the future generation of surgeons and super specialists. Working as a surgeon requires, I think, more than the medical field teamwork. So you need to be a team player. You need to take along your, your nursing team, your, your, your anesthesiologist. Your, there's this uh, whole lot of teamwork involved in, in surgery. So if you're not a team person, then maybe you need to look elsewhere. 
like uh, Dr. N. G. K. Pillay said, communication is very important. Communicating with each other, with the members of your team, with the patient, with uh, the bystanders, getting the proper informed consent, all of this can prevent uh, a lot of bitter medical legal battles. Another thing that I always insist upon is proper documentation. You write what has happened, when it has happened. If you see a patient, start with your date and time. See who has written, write who has written, uh, who has seen the patient, document the whole thing. And even if something goes wrong, when your documents are produced in court, you have everything written in black and white. Last but not the least, you should adapt. You should be able to adapt to change. Every, every five years, you have new technology developing. And you need to change with times. Even now, with the COVID pandemic, we've been forced to change. Now, there's a lot of teleconsultations where we would have preferred to see the patients and touch the patients. We would have loved to host you here at our wonderful campus in America, uh, conducting this push like we did the last two years. But then we are forced to do this as a virtual conference. Those interested in research should do genuine research, should come out with publications. And like our principal sir was saying, leaders, leaders are not born. You have, you have to work on, on leadership skills. So before I end, I'd like to wish all of you a happy career ahead of you. Please, I hope you utilize this conference, will, uh, your interactions with uh, uh, experts in different fields tomorrow will throw a light as to which way you would want your career to go. Thank you. So, eight speakers, I think we have taken nearly two hours, 50 minutes. So, I think before I take the questions, I'll just sum up a few things. That what, what I could, you know, sort of summarize from today's deliberations are, one, history taking, and that's what is very important. Professor M.G.K. Pillay was very, very clear in explaining that aspect, how important it is. So please do not lose the skills of history taking and clinical examination. Documentation, very important. It unnecessarily it will land into legal problems, you know, if you do not document. If you have not documented, you have not done it. Remember, it's very, very as simple as that. Good communication, Professor. Jai Kumar sir, then even uh, Professor Suri Ayer sir, they all mentioned about the importance of good communication. Even Professor Prince Lewis ma'am was telling her various languages. I think it's so important, you know, to communicate well. Passion, you know, whatever you like, do what you like. It's likely to, you know, be, you know, make you happier in the later on in life. Teamwork, what Dr. Suri Ayer highlighted it. Then adaptation to change, what Dr. Pradeep Jacob was saying. You see, there will be a changing environment. Now, if you have to, the environment change, now COVIDology will be, it's a subject, no? because it's the major thing. We have to learn it. Money, no? So, you can, I think what, I think what Professor Pemsi Leo said, only you work, no, money will come. Don't worry, that should not be your, you know, uh, main consideration, I think. You will finally reach where you have to reach, I think, sooner or later. 
then swot analysis you know strengths what are your strengths you need to you know work on them take advantage of that weaknesses you have to work to improve it get you know get out of the it's very important opportunities and threats that is very important what are the opportunities which will come away and what are the things which can you know and then very rightly brought out by uh, ma'am because this is one thing which i realize is a very important factor is as a lady you know that uh, marriage then family all those things have to be you know like same thing with men also but more so in ladies women it is very important i see some of my students you know they are they have told me the parental pressure and getting you know getting them married and they finish their internship that they have told them that we want to get a post graduation so anyway i cannot do anything with that personal thing but you know these are the challenges which are there i do i can see in front of what is in front of us so this is a few things which i thought now i'll just take on a few questions professor jay kumar there is a question for you sir you are so inspiring what advice would you like to give to our students on how to communicate effectively with children so so that is a fantastic question i was expecting this question you know uh, immediately after joining the pediatrics after my mbbs you know i was really frustrated how to communicate with these children how to attract the attention of the children the moment you go to the child they'll be crying like anything and then you are total desperate situation then i thought uh, i got a prize of uh, one smiling competition so then i used to smile to them uh, then if you smile to them they stop crying so and in, in turn if they smile the inference is that child is not suffering from illness if a child is able to, a child who is able to smiles back to you child no is not suffering from any serious illness and for that matter you know that in a newborn baby if a baby is able to smiles back to you at the age of 6 weeks or 8 weeks that baby's mentation is normal even if you take a ct scan mri scan spec scan pet scan you won't that get that much information that you are gaining from their social smile so smile to a baby instead then uh, tickle the baby tickle make moments like that listen to them tell them though you are a good shot and all that you are a good boy you are see it like that and then in that way you can attract the attention of the child then child will allow you to examine and then communication communication to with the parents is very important and you have to make use of their own language what they are expecting from us always give a confidence never say like that oh idu valare serious aanu rakshayila that never say like that never say like that ningal nokkatte ningale cheyavana maximum cheyya allada idu rakshayilla idu oru rakshayilla so never say like that avare endellam pradeshayode hopper aanu varunna even when you know that the condition is very serious that we can have a person in a nice way careful way so in that way i used to get the conference of the parents it's a very nicely uh, explained by sir in fact i recollect you know when i was doing my training in rheumatology at aims there was one child around i think 9 years old his he needed bilateral knee aspiration and injection and which is then free of cost in aims because even methyl prednisolone acetate is provided free including syringes there is nil expenditure in the joint aspiration and we do about at that time we used to do about 150 175 cases in a week so it's a very very busy clinic so uh, i remember this style you know his father told me that they were given him some one of the private hospital given him an estimate of 45000 rupees and the child was sensible so i told him that i explained to him everything and i went ahead and did the knee aspiration and injection it like so you know everything can be achieved i think what's a broad out like i think good communication is a very important you know mm-hmm. and never underestimate the child actually that if you think that a 3 year old child you can't get hp it's not like that what what you know sir knows much better but you have seen that you just listen to them you know they will slowly it will you only be more patient request dr subramani ayer so with a kind permission sure i shall be to go sure, because sure. my mother is waiting there because she is alone there, there are some you know uh, yes, uh, some conditions so, so thank you so yeah, much yeah. once again thank you students wish you all the best once again. on behalf of dr jay kumar you know i convey his uh, thanks to all of you and dr subramani ayer uh, there is a question for you sir i am 
This is from one of the students says, I'm currently in my final year and I don't know what specialty to choose. What advice can you give? Dr. Ayer, sir. If he is not there, I think I think we'll uh, give this. Uh, I think Dr. Gopal Pillai can take this question. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that question. So the first thing that we have to know is, uh, what do you want to do 20 years from now? That's a very important question that you need to answer for yours. Nobody else can answer that question for yours. Uh, what is it that you would like to do? The, the difference between the West versus us is that we have to take the decision very early in life. Whereas in the West, many people like one of the most, uh, most senior, most retinal surgeons, uh, he has actually been an aeronautical engineer. And after finishing that and working that for some time, he realized that that is not his, he doesn't like it so much. So he moved on. And he did medicine and ophthalmology and then retinal surgery. And now all the new, new surgical equipment, because he knows the physics behind it, he knows how to manufacture those. So the vitrectomy machines, the probes, everything he is making. So that is that. So he, over a period of 50 years, at 50 years, he decides that, you know, I have to move into biomedical engineering of retinal equipment with my expertise. That is a guy who, who moves across his passion. But unfortunately in India, we are brought up to find, to say that, you know, at a very young age, at, at 17 years, you have to decide whether you have to become a doctor or not, or what do you want to be? Or at, and at about 23 or 24, you have to, 22 or 23, you have to decide which specialty I have to take. So one thing is sure, any specialty you take, if you excel in it, there's nothing like that. Every specialty is good. There is no specialty which is good specialty or bad specialty. Like, for example, in 1980s, radiology was only about x-rays. And now, we see where radiology is, interventional radiology is, you know, the, the most, uh, you know, uh, the first rank in the All India Institute or uh, All India exam will take radiology. So that is a difference. So, so some of the specialties may not be good at this point of time, which may bloom into a, who would take nuclear medicine some uh, 10 years, 15, 20 years back, nobody would take. But now see how much it is transformed. So each of the specialties are good. Now for you, you have to find out whether, see like the broad specialties of medicine, surgery, gynecology, and pediatrics are an indication. You know, the amount of time that you spend with ophthalmology, ENT, orthopedics, uh, they are all very, very psychiatry, uh, dermatology, are very small. But these broad categories and the internship that you do in it. So as uh, Pradeep, uh, as Pradeep Jacob said, if you are completely um, spending your time uh, of uh, internship and studying for NEET, you will not actually do the internship. So if you do the internship and if you know which is the broad area which actually makes you happy, that is one area that you can take. Now, as I told you, there are a lot of things involving the health uh, economics dynamics which will make you uh, select something of less teamwork, less infrastructure, so that your market is more. So all those are different aspects which you should be thinking at the cerebral level. But what is in the heart is what you would do during that internship period. And you should, uh, to make yourself happy, I think you should look at the heart. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. I think that's a very uh, beautiful thing, like, you know, the way you have mentioned. Actually, Probably you don't get much exposure in uh, certain subjects like ophthalmology, ENT, but if you are very keen, then probably you may do another short observership or something, or you can even request the HOD to, you know, uh, maybe allow you to work for another two weeks extra, because I think those are definitely like we, we find uh, some of the students, you know, from uh, Canada and the US, they are coming here for shadowing. Then they are doing like BSc in biochemistry and then because they want to decide whether they want to do medicine or not. So they come here and they shadow a doctor for two weeks, I think three weeks. I think probably you need to spend and what I really appreciate that point. You really don't know, like like one girl the other day came to me, she said, I'm interested in radiation oncology. Now that's a 
postgraduate subject but again it's not there is no exposure to radiation oncology during your uh, internship also so i she went to the hod and professor bernard and the tells our head of uh, radiation oncology and he gave her a very good briefing showed her the machines and showed her as to what type of work goes on i think uh, one can definitely get a lot of uh, information the next question is for dr prince louis ma'am madam with the dawn of the biotech revolution will biologics completely replace chemical drugs oh, uh, this is uh, something that reflects on what is happening in technology technology is here to advance science will advance knowledge pushes to the limits beyond the horizons so you can always expect biologics or any other it's may be coming along but it cannot uh, replace or the the uh, presence of the drugs that are here that are natural synthetic chemical all will be there and they can go on in fact they may not even be biologics they may be just gene therapy a crispr cas9 can correct everything right once and for all and for generations together so those are the things that we are facing so friends Dr. Pradeep also did say adaptation. What is new? I, I would like to ask the question: Who came first, the hen or the egg? What came first, drug or the resistance by anti uh, by the bacteria? The bacterial resistance is inherent in it. Drugs come by, right? So uh, this is all I have to say. It's a um, uh, it's a take on how you are going to get along with it. and when new things come biologics are coming to you are having even uh, you know subjects that go along with it you are having bio vigilance you know just like you have pharmaco vigilance now you are having bio vigilance because of the in of biologics into it so all these are part of it but nothing replaces it takes time and this so you have got to study your pharmacology thoroughly to be a good doctor just be a good detective Think, have the suspicion like a Sherlock Holmes, and uh, find the right diagnosis and give the correct therapy. For that, you have to know pharmacology. Be it a surgeon, be it a physician, pharmacology is here to stay, in whatever way. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, biologics are also eventually going to be taught by the pharmacology only. and uh, what we have seen like i can share from rheumatology when i started my training 2002 you know infliximab had just entered the indian market in 2001 2002 then later on it and as uh, adalilumab and you know golimumab tocilizumab and abatacept so many biologics ladder and you can't just straight away you know up front go into you know there is because, and how how many years have you used a particular biologic This is a drug like methotrexate, which is fifty uh, odd years old. A sulfasalazine also fifty plus years old. There's a little sixty years. So there's a lot of you know. Uh, you have enough data also to substantiate as to what is the profile. So you can balance it all. So this is the last question of the day for Professor Pradeep Jacob. So will robots be our friends or foes with the advent of artificial intelligence? A very, uh, I must say, a really a challenging question. Uh, just like I was telling you, know, we need to adapt, adapt to the changing times. When I trained, we were all taught conventional open surgery. Then came minimal access surgery, and everyone. went in for training for minimal access surgery and that was the gold standard and now that we have robotic surgery in 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 different fields not just in uh general surgery you have that in uh, onco surgery you have that in orthopedics neuro surgery it is it, it just improves the work that the surgeon does it is never going to replace a surgeon it just improves the quality of work that a good surgeon does yeah. uh 10 years down the line like a lot of lot of artificial intelligence is going to come in and we need to 
work along with that and improve your clinical practice based on technology that is available at that present time. It is never going to replace surgeons or clinicians as you see them right now. You just improve the way they function. Uh, thank you, Professor Jacob. So now, as we about we are ending, as I understood that there are probably more than 600 students who attended this. Uh, event, and uh, what I can say is that there is something, you know, there are a lot of positives one can take from this. And I think before we wind up, I think it will be fairly, it will be fair on my part if I was to introduce the theme of our, you know, the 2017 batch who are present here, they've been toiling hard for the last many months. Doctor, uh, can I call Mr. Ashwin Pillai? Uh, Sham, uh, no, Shrikant is there. Shrikant, who are not available right now? Gauri, come, 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 please come at least. You, know, I, 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 you come, you look into that. They'll be, you know, can you turn towards them? Yeah, this is Ashwin Pillai. Then the tall man behind him is Shrikant. Then Gauri. Then Joseph, in fact, they're the ones who have been working very hard. And in fact, I want to say that in this COVID, you know, last few, few years, there were 40, 50 people involved, you know. But here, because of the, the, you know, COVID issue, only about five of the six of them have been able to come from, because they are from nearby. Others are all in other places. So it's a huge effort. And uh, Yatish Reddy is also there. He's also very much here. So come, 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 Yatish. So anyway, they they are all uh, they worked very hard to make this uh, successful event. Yeah, this is Yatish Reddy. He's again been working very hard on this. In fact, Nitya is also there. The, the, the our office staff they've been again working very hard on this. So I just thought it would be fair to you know give them their due. Uh, a round of applause for them. And uh, definitely the Arundam Mishra. Karan Dhillan, uh, Shri Hari, and uh, Krishan, no? Krishan, 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 and uh, our Anuja Jayan, Apurva, Ishit Agarwal. There's a list is very long actually. So anyway, uh, they're the ones, and I'm sure I hope this could be proved to be useful for all of you. And I thank all the faculty. So one of you can talk again. So that's a I thank all the faculty who took part, uh, the, all the eight faculty members which have been introduced already to you. I thank them for sparing their time. Professor Pradeep Jacob and Dr. George Matthew John is also here. Come, come, George. George is Associate Professor in surgery. A very, he's been in the, you know, been leading the, you know, always very uh, student friendly and has been working very hard and squashed. And uh, you know, supporting the students in this uh, effort. So, from all of us here and the other speakers who are who are online with us, I convey our uh, gratitude to all of you for having spared your time to attend this. And I hope it is proves to be of use to you. And you are welcome. You have our uh, line. If there are any more questions, we will definitely uh, look into it and get back to you definitely. Thank you very much. With this, we conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our staff also, the AV staff and the office staff, I just say thanks to you. On behalf of the whole team, I thank them. Thank you very much.